Well, first, Holmes was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. Sup, Holmes? Beware, your host, Jonathan Pose. Thank you so much, Sinistar. And thank you, Matt Pozan, for being on the show. This is such <laughs> an event. This is an hey. event for... Thank you. I've yeah. heard about you for years and years. I'm trying to remember the first time I heard the name Matt Bozon. I think it was probably year 2000-ish, maybe. Yeah, maybe yeah. it was around the time Shantae came out. Sure. Uh, yeah. So you've been a kind of a legendary, shadowy figure in the video well, game world <laughs> for a while. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. It's uh, uh, it's uh, exciting to, to get to know you. And um, I'm sure you're sick of being mixed up with your brother. So oh, let's yeah. make it clear for everyone right off the, the top. You are Matt Bozon, who has only made video games. Have you that's ever written about them as well? No. No, I haven't. No. So, We're, yeah, but that's but what... your brother Mark was at IGN for a little bit. Yeah, he was over there, and it was always confusing because for um, because there was Matt Cosmasina, and then there was Mark, like Mark Bozon, right? So you'd get, um, you'd get stories that are... Um, you know, Matt and Mark Bozon or, or whatever, but it's totally fine because he, you know, this is, um, you know, after years of of, of uh, it getting mixed up the other way around, it's just it's just my come up and so it's fine, yeah. <laughs> no problem. And is he older or younger than you? No, he's younger. We've got, um, yeah, our, there's, there's three of us, our older sister Gretchen and then me and then there's a 12-year gap and then there's Mark. So we've got, oh, a, wow. yeah, our family, there's a, there's a 60s kid and I'm the 70s kid and he's the 80s kid. So oh, cool. it's good, yeah. yeah and so is Gretchen was... into video games as well? Is no, it like all, a... all the rest of our, our family are educators. So, um, yeah, teachers and, and um, you know, print, the school principals and brailleists and, and things of that nature. So, and then, and then me and Mark, you know, throwing our lives away. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, Mom. Um, yeah, but we're, we, we love it. But everybody, uh, you know, we always have good stories when we, when we come back and, Get the family together. So, yeah. Sure, hey, did. also, they... I'm, yeah. I'm, look, I'm looking. I'm looking at you, and I should probably look up here. Hey, everybody. I'm kind of new to the, the webcast thing. This is this is not not normal for me. So, oh, not at all. Hello. You're doing great. But uh, they do like it when you make eye contact with the camera. They Which do. Um, who, who, yeah. Hey. Hey. Hello. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, is it weird when you go to see your family and they're all talking about? Being educators or being, you know, other types of adults. And uh, the stories are about uh, the video game industry. Yeah, it's um, it's fun. I mean, we 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 have a great time. I mean, I think everybody understands it. We have a, a weird sense of humor. Everybody in our family has a weird sense of humor. So, it it kind of doesn't matter what what we're all doing career wise. But we we have some really, the the stories. I mean, we really have it. We have it pretty easy compared to you know. What uh, what a principal or vice principal has, um, I mean, the stuff they deal with is 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 insane. Our stuff, on, in the end, if we entertain people and they got to have a good time with our products, you know, we're doing our jobs well. So um, it gets intense. We have we have deadlines and hard stuff in the game industry, but it's it's still it's entertainment. So you know, it's hard it's hard to have a wrong answer here. So, um, yeah, it makes yeah. sense that uh, you have education kind of in your blood because uh, a good game often teaches the player how to play it in a way that they enjoy and they end up feeling right. like they they uh, got to know the developer through uh, their design. So it kind of makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a great point, and I, I think that is kind of um, something that we have a lot. And, and you know, at WayForward, um, way back when, we were, we were an educational company. We were owned from, oh, boy, it was uh, 1994, five, five, somewhere in there, um, 94 for maybe two two years, like Super Nintendo era. Our first game was Super Nintendo, and then we got purchased by American Education Publishing. And at that time, you know, a lot of the things that we we did for, with those games is still with us, and it's that you can't just drill somebody into knowledge. They have to, you have to set them up with an example so that they can put it together and that their brain can, um, you know, have the experience of, of solving a thing for themselves so that, so they learn. I mean, that's, that's, that's how you actually educate your your I don't know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. No, That's what uh, how absolutely. get smart when brain turn on and get better. Um, <laughs> you, sure. you have to, yeah, you have to do that. You can't you can't just transfer the knowledge into their into their head. And I think that's how we like to treat our game tutorials too, is make sure that they they learn it. You know, they they learn it by doing it. So And it's been really yeah. exciting to watch you get better at that and come at it from different angles, uh, particularly with your original games. 
uh, oh, Shantae, yeah. the Mighty series. Uh, Mighty Flip Champs, really, that was the game that changed my way of looking at Way Forward from, like, oh, okay, yeah. these guys do great animation. I've always thought that, that your your artistic sensibility and your prioritization of, of classic uh, art styles um, with a heavy emphasis on craft yeah. and uh, sticking to kind of the core tenets of a lot of arcade style or, or classic console style uh, game design. That's why I was went to Way Forward to, but then I played Flip Champs, and I was like, he's going <laughs> to... Uh, uh, more than willing to pull uh, the rug out from under me and and, and torture <laughs> me a little bit, but make me yeah. think in a way that um that was really exciting. And that was geez, when did Flip Champs come out now? Flip Champs was um, let's see, that was um, DSiWare. What would that be? Two thousand seven, two thousand six, two thousand seven. Yeah, that's been my right. first D three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. After Contra, right? Contra was two thousand six and seven, I think. Well, and, and you know that's because that was di- that's when digital started for us, digital download, and that's when we finally could make the games the way we wanted to make them, without mm-hmm. having to make an argument for, you know, hey hey publisher, risk your money and manufacture this game, and um, you know that that's something we could go into at some point on on the show today if you want to talk about it because it's sure. there's a lot there's a lot to that, um, but yeah, that's a game where we just made what we wanted to make, and it was if you can probably tell the mighty flip champs, it's a cheap. It's a, it's a very inexpensive development. There's one art set. It's just been palette shifted several different ways, and it recycles some some art. Um, if you look closely, you notice there's some Shantae Risky's Revenge art in the background of um, Flip Champs, like the leaves and the trees and things. Those are all repurposed, and you know some of the oh. parts are, are are hobbled together from the old Game Boy Advance Shantae too. There's there's art. We just kind of borrowed some stuff and put it together. And once there was a good proof of concept for the game, and it seemed fun. Um, we're like, you know, this game isn't really about the the tile sets so much. It's about the block arrangements and the puzzle and the level. And yeah, it seemed like once we had had that established, we just blew through that game very quickly. I think I'm off topic, but you were asking, um, uh, or you were saying that's kind of when you started to notice more way forward games, right? That's when I started to get the uh, idea that way forward voice wasn't just like we do uh, the right. classic style very well. We're going to, you know, be willing to kind of twist your head around a little bit and, and hurt you more. Yeah. Uh, but you hurt me in a way that I <laughs> knew that the answer was there, and, and I knew that um, if I managed to master the game, I could get through it very quickly. So um, yeah. that's the kind of difficulty I think is getting really big uh, these days with games like mm-hmm. Spelunky and Binding oh, of sure, Isaac, yeah. and you, you guys have uh, yeah. been at that approach for kind of a while. And that little jet jetpack cat, and the and the the fish man, yeah, I love those guys. <laughs> that that yeah. character design too really woke me up to the idea that Way Forward isn't just gonna be able to take licensed properties and and uh, right. give them new voice. You've got a really unique idea about character design yourself. Yeah, yeah, we yeah we love um you know we love designing characters and we've been given lots of opportunities to work with other other characters like tons of them like I couldn't I could I could try but I I won't I, I would fail so I'm gonna not try to come up with all the licensed games we've done over the years but there's been tons of them <clears throat> and and you know the game industry was still fairly young when we started doing this in ninety um ninety three I think it was or ninety ninety two. And so there are a lot of ago. Yeah. yeah, I think it's 20, 23, 22, 23, somewhere on there. Um, but so many characters that had never been in games at all. So, you know, when we did Mickey's Ultimate Challenge, that was the first game back um, on the Super Nintendo, that he had been in other games. And we were looking at Mickey's Magical Quest and things like that and, and learning. You know, I would consider that phase for Way Forward to be learning from the masters. You know, we're yeah. looking at Capcom and like, well, what are they doing? How do they how do they do this? Like, look at the, look at the similarities between... Um, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, and Mickey's uh, Magical Quest, and um, Demon's Crest, and a lot of a lot of the games of the day, are going well. They're using the same rule set. They're building the same tile size from game to game. The technology is probably the same. We should do that too. We should build our tech similar to the way that they're building their tech, and we should make our processes like their processes. Because look at how they're able to belt out these quality games time and again. So yeah, early early on, we we're kind of following in 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 their footsteps and looking at how they treat licensed games with like the uh, Disney's Aladdin and um, and there, there's a bunch. You remember all of the ones from back in the Super Nintendo oh, sure. day? Duct yeah. Tales, of course. Yeah, too. yeah. Oh, and they were and they were great. Um, yeah, and we had we had the you know this we started the company after the NES had kind of concluded. It was all starting to be about the Super Nintendo, so we had that. But the stuff that was new 
you know, I guess it's weird to think of it that way, but the emerging tech of the day was, sorry, the, emer the emerging tech of the day was um, games with sound in them, right? Like discs that were, you know, you could, a 2.5 uh, floppy disc instead of a 5-inch floppy. I know it's crazy, right? Um, Super Nintendo, like, oh, we could put, you know, we can put multiple layers of background in there, and we've got more colors to run with. It's really silly. I don't know. Sound, sounds crazy and, and old, but um, no, it's good for people yeah. to be able to envision the fact that at that time that was that was like PS4, the uh, Xbox One, to be able to do parallax scrolling and Mode Seven. Oh yeah, it was rotation a big deal. and stuff like that. Absolutely, it was a, it uh, was a big deal. Yeah. And how did it come to be that your first game with uh with what you know we would call indie by today's standards indie uh, game developer was a Mickey Mouse game on the on a console no less. That's, oh okay, it's pretty incredible. How did that come to, to come yeah, to happen? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that that project is really all about how um <clears throat> like how the the company came together. I mean, okay, so before that, um, speaking for Voldy a little bit, um, so his his first couple of years he was completely independent. He was working out of Irvine, and he had um he had a game called Fun Pack. Which was a, a, I mean, I, I think it was a million seller back then. This was before it was just him all by himself, and he had. Um, it was one of those things you'd go and you'd you'd see it. On, it was like impulse buy aisle type game, and it was games that were reminiscent of Pac-Man. And there was a game called Jewel Thief, and and you know like an arcade pack, and you just get this thing and you stick it in your computer and have some fun Sorry, with it. Um, yeah, yeah. So it was it was that. Um, he got into console development, and um, he was working with a bunch of guys who were starting up. Um, Let's see. I know Greg Tavares was one of those those guys back when the, you know, I think this was pre Cool Spot and all those all the slew of Virgin games. You remember that? All, all the mm -hmm. Cool Cool Spot and and Lion King and Global Gladiators and um, I think Lion King was in that tech. I'm pretty sure. Anyway, all the games of that era, they were building some common tech and tools together. So our our first game was using um, the the same level design tools and stuff that that they were building. Um, but uh, let's see. Get, get me back. Get me back to where I was going here. So, um, how do we get involved, so, right? Yeah. Yeah. Vol how did you get involved with Voldyway? Who? Right. Well, that's where the name Way Forward comes from, I believe. Yeah. And you and he were, are kind of the, the captains of Way Forward. Is that? Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 two two thirds. There's um there's another guy. So he, the way the way that went down is Voldy was working on this game that he got subcontracted to do. So it was him. He was programming it. A couple other guys um working together on this, and they had their you know they had the their Super Nintendo dev kit and stuff down in Irvine, and they're like, "Well, it's Mickey Mouse. We're gonna need we're gonna need people who know character animation." Well, there's this guy, the 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 person who's kind of missing in the uh, in in this conversation is Rob Buchanan. Um, so Rob is um, another animator. He and I both were going to school at CalArts, and so Rob and Voldy met because um, uh, let's see, wow, there was some there was a, a a person they had in common who was doing voices for Rob's animated film. So like, oh, I know a guy. Um, his name's Rob Buchanan. He could probably do do the animation for your Mickey Mouse game. So, um, you know, so he's at Cal Arts, taking this on as a freelance gig, just clicking away pixels, making Mickey Mouse. And um, at the time, I think he he was, you know, he played some games, but was not um, totally game focused, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of knew each other. I'm and I'm walking by at school, and and he's clicking pixels, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this looks like video game stuff. That's cool. And and back back at Cal, at Cal Arts in in the um, early 90s, you went there to go to either Disney or Warner Brothers, and that was it. There was no video game industry. You didn't do that as a job. Um, and and I go, I, I think I know what he's doing. And I walked by and and um, and we're and we're talking about it. And and I said, yeah, you know what? This will the way this is this is going. I've seen this before. You're you're probably limited to the number of colors you use. He's like, yeah, they said something about that. Um, and so we're I, I'm no, and I'm I'm no no expert. Ne like neither of us was an expert. He's a guy who had the task of getting this thing done. I'm a guy who had a lot of ner nerd um, gamer um, wiring in my brain, right? And, and so we started clicking on it together. And he goes, hey, do you want to help with this? And, and maybe we'll just do, work on it together. And so we did. So that that's how that ended up. And then, um, w I mean, weirdly, this is really actually for real how this happened, is Voldy came up to visit. Um, Rob and I uh, later were, were roommates, still working on this game like months later. And Voldy came up to check in on, on our progress, and um, the 1994 quake happened. And um, uh, uh, what the Northridge, you know, split the five freeway in half, the Northridge quake. So Voldy was stranded on this side of the freeway from his office, so he just decided to start way forward in our apartment, and that's where the company began. So it was me and... Yeah. When you first said Quake, I thought you meant the game Quake. Oh, no. There and was... Then, no. There, 
from you the remember, actual earthquake. No, there was a, this was around. Yeah, this was this was pre pre or right on the like when Doom came out, right? So yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no quake yet. Uh, but an actual well, earthquake helped you to yeah be an actual earthquake. Wow. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, like like both figuratively and literally, that's why we are where we are today. So we ran the we ran the company. The three of us ran the company out of the apartment. So it was Voldy as programmer and, and tools guy, and um and Vol uh, sorry and Rob and me as animation. So Rob very much like classically trained a like actor animator, and me as the I think I can put the video game stuff together, doing backgrounds and pixeling stuff and you know tile sets and all the all that kind of thing. Um, and then when um, a little bit later. Uh, Voldy, Voldy, you know, we had a really, I, I think back on it, we had a really awkward conversation at, at our at our mall one day. We're going to get, you know, I don't know what we were doing. We're going to the mall to get some food. And um, and he's like, hey, so I think this should become a company and and one of us needs to be in charge and the other two need to be employees. <laughs> and we're like, okay. He's like, I think I should be the president and you guys should be the employees of this, of this company. Do you want to do it? And Rob's like, yes, that sounds awesome. And I said, oh, I want to think about it. I want to think about it. And so... Um, that and that's how it went. I went and did um I went and did some stuff for a little bit. Do you remember the um do you remember the two thousand like two thousand and one Doom pack levels by Wizard Works? Forever like forever ago. You'd go into a software, etc. and you'd see this box and it's like two thousand Doom levels. Oh my gosh, there's so many Doom levels, I can't believe it. Um you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I think <laughs> some, I know what some, you're talking about. Some, Okay, somebody out there probably knows. Um, there was that, and there was some educational stuff. Um, VTech was doing a lot of educational things. Um, so I went and uh, and worked with um, with VTech for a couple of years because I wanted to try, still try it out. Like not as an employee of them, but just um, you know trying to trying to. I wanted. I was trying to find a way to, to get back into games because it seemed as though the next projects were going to be educational CD-ROMs. So we did mm -hmm. some CD-ROM stuff, and then by um, by '95, that's when I kind of came back in and went, "All right, I I think I want to join up for for reels," and that was uh, that was around the time when we started to really, um, uh, you know, take it more seriously as a as an actual company and have employees and try to have regular business and get a building and um, you know things like that, things you think of when you when you sure. think of a, of a company. Uh, but before so that, before no, it's that, just, it was just out of the apartment, and then you got yeah. bought by educational software yeah. company. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly huh. right. So we were out of the, we were out of an apartment for a while, and then um, what started happening around that time is you know people started started uh, um, getting getting you know married, and you you know we're divvying up. It was actually ridiculous. We had a, a point in time where, um, geez, there were three of us who who all got. Um, the different roommates got married at the same time, so we kind of had like did this apartment shuffle, um, and then yeah, once that kind of sorry, a bit of a weird tangent, but once we uh -huh. got to the point where we needed to move out of the apartments and get you know a real a real place, um, yeah, that was uh, trying to think think of when that was, but yeah, that, wait, sorry, give me your give me your question one more time. I got oh no no this, no, happens, uh, just... this happens to me a lot. You're getting the real experience. This is what it's like <laughs> when you like think poor Austin trying to explain himself or. Jeff Luke or, or Adam or any of the people you've had on the show. This is what it's like to, to try to have a conversation with me. It's I'm loving it's, it. I'm getting it's, all this it's, information. It's, I'm imagining <laughs> you, a young Matt Boson, in the apartment <laughs> typing away, trying yeah, yeah. To, to make sprites out of. I don't even know what computer program you might have been using back we were, then. And you had no we internet were, to, to no, help no, guide you either. No, no internet. We were doing things in Deluxe Paint. Um, that was an EA paint program, and we didn't have a computer. We were on a TV, so we're click. You know, we had there was a computer like a. CPU, but it's plugged into a television. So you're trying to pixel, but you can't see pixels. You can only see RGB, you know, those luminous things you have on your 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 old school TV. So Whoa. it was it was crazy, yeah. And it's like, I want to check my work. Give me the computer, and then we'd unplug it and give it to the other guy, and then we'd send it. Yeah, this. And you were asking about the educational stuff. I mean, this is still kind of the same phase. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Brighter Child um, uh, bought Way Forward. So we had. For a few years there, everything we did had the um, American Education Publishing Brighter Child label across the top of it, and that's the stuff you'll still see it. If you go into bookstores, you'll see these walls of of, um, of workbooks, and they're these these you know thin, floppy things. A lot of I mean, a lot of kids were raised on these. You might even recognize them. Um, yeah, so I'm like, oh yeah, I, I I get what this is. I've seen this stuff before. And um, we were adapting those things to games, and they were featuring the Muppets. So we did a lot of Muppet stuff. But back, yeah, back then it was weird. We'd we'd do the work on our on our TV or at the <laughs> at the offices. We're starting to get better equipment. And then, yeah, there was not really internet. We get on the phone and talk to Henson Productions in New York and say, "Hey, we're going to send you guys some faxes of what the pixel art looks like." And they would look at it, or or they would um, 
or, or we'd send them a, a digital file, or we'd mail them a disk, right? And we get on a phone call, and they're like, hey, how, what do you think? How does Kermit look? Does he look okay? And they're like, we're not sure. The, the computer's up on the seventh floor. We're waiting for it to get delivered down here so we can check it out. Um, it's like, you know, and they're like, who's got the computer today? It's like the computer's, you know, they're using it for, I don't know, whatever, Labyrinth or something. I don't know what it was. Labyrinth was way back. I'm, I'm making that up. Um, but yeah, it, I'm trying to no, remember 90. Uh, might have been Muppet Treasure Island by that time. Yeah, it probably was. It was probably things like um, remembering the stuff they had in their their lobby was was cool. They had just so so many neat neat things, and um, yeah, we'd get to go down there, and a couple times we got to work with the voice actor. So I got to like, I got to like talk to the guy doing doing Gonzo. I'm like, oh no, it's written more like this, and he's like, oh okay, and he's he's it was amazing. So we I, was it the real Gonzo? They have. A couple people were doing Gonzo at that at that time, <laughs> so huh. I don't know which guy it was. Gonzo. But but I was so your I was first game is Mickey yeah. Mouse. Your first game, like the most iconic yeah. cartoon character ever. Yeah, and you're making it out of your apartment, and then yeah. uh, not too long after that, you're talking to Henson. Oh yeah, about yeah. using their. Yeah, it was what great. was that like to to be it was cool. they were... fresh out of school and and. Man. Well, it, uh, it, yeah. it messes with your expectations. Cause I'm like, wow, every day is going to be like this. This is cool. And I mean, a lot of cases, a lot of it kind of is still like that. I mean, you'd be surprised. All I mean, all these these people in this industry, they're just, they're just regular people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're working on Adventure Time, and Pen, you walk by, and Penn Ward is sitting in a cubicle, and like, oh, what you, what are you doing? He's like, he's like, oh, I'm like, never mind. I, sorry, I bugged you, dude. And he's just back at it, you know, doing whatever he was doing. Um, it it's uh, it's great. I mean, people just want to make something cool and they're just looking for like-minded people to get together and make stuff with them and it was like that then and it's still like that now. I think where it got a little di dicey was um, you know, certain times when you're fighting over control and that's where it gets difficult. So when you get the, um, especially when it's control over your intellectual, uh, intellectual, inter your intellectual property and your, um, where it intersects with, with the tech. So we'd get stuff back then from um, from Henson, and they were great, but it was really hard to explain to them pixel art. So they would send us these these beautiful drawings, and they would have Kermit, and he's he's put back on model. Like, hey, you guys deviated. You turned him into like these little they're like there's little notches all along the side of his head where it looks like a little animal bit at him. And and we're like, well, that's pixels. And they're like, well, smooth that out, and then you're good to go. <laughs> and we're like, okay, but you know, they're like his. His pupils are too are too are too big, and we're like, well, that's because it's only it's one pixel. That's all he can have, and and they're like, well, if you can make that pixel about a half of the size, then you're good to go. We're like, ah, you you, you can't. A pixel is the smallest unit of measure. Like, I don't understand. So we dealt with a lot of that, and so I think that kind of thing has um, it's had a huge effect on us in in terms of getting used to um, how to work with people, how to work with licensors and and publishers, and as this industry has just moved on and on, and it just changes all the time. There's a lot of these fundamental things that we learned that um, it's people don't always understand the tech you're dealing with. I mean, I don't understand. These, these guys helped me um, make a, a Google Plus account just now because I'm like, I don't know. I was doing something else for a year or two years, slipped away, and I wasn't paying attention. Like, and, and they're like, here, put this headset on. It'll just it'll just work. I'm like, okay, okay. So, um, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah the technology has, has changed so much, but WayForward has, in my mind, one of the things I love about the company today is that the, the industry – has gone in so many different directions, but so much about WayForward has stayed true to the things that got me into video games in the first place, which is, you know, changing the way I think with the design, but staying uh, loyal to a lot of the, the art styles that that I feel more affinity mm -hmm. towards. So I'm glad that you're not... Too, you did do Lit, which was polygon-based. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got a lot of polygon-based graphics. So it's not as though you're tech-adverse, but you've stayed true to right. a lot of the... Uh, 2D animation, would you say that's because that's what you went to school for and that's where your love of games came from yeah. or is it because yeah. it's what you're good at or all of the above? I, I think it's all of the above, but it's, um, yeah, we have we have really, really good 3D people here. Um, we did, for a long time, I think that was a place where it was a struggle because there'd be one or two people who were 3D artists and they were really into it and that's what, what they wanted to do and, um, and, and I think now there's a better split, um, but we, what we really want to do is make sure that people understand fundamentally why, like what we're doing, like I, I get um, I do. I do a lot to try to make sure that, that people are remembering first that it's it's entertainment. It's entertainment. So like you can get really good at the tools, but you, in the end of the day, there's somebody on the other side of a screen, and you're just trying to make them happy. Like you're just trying to get a reaction or make them smile or have. A, you know, they may have had a terrible day. They they want entertainment. They're 
putting your, your product in, and they just want to be delighted and have a good time. Um, and so we have to remember that it's about entertaining and not, you know, it could be, uh, of course, in order to be entertaining and keep relevant, we have to be up on our tech, and our stuff has to be competitive, and it has to look as, as good or better than, than the next guy's uh, stuff. But, you know, there's no rule about how to make somebody... Um, happy you're delighted. So to kind of wrap that back back into the why we do it the way we do it is all of these tools are great and, and that's something that they impressed upon us very early at, at CalArts and since a lot of the um, the people we've recruited are from CalArts and, and we're, we're in Valencia so we can be just right up the street get a lot of um, like Disney talent um, and bring them in. We just want to make sure that they don't fixate too much on the tools like I would, some of the people here who have um, just, uh, I would use them as examples of how this works beautifully is that they are just a talented person. If you give them 3D, uh, a 3D program and let them, just turn them loose and see what they do, they'll entertain you and make something amazing whether they're animating in 3D or whether they're animating in clay or pixels or on, on you know, pencil and paper. It's, it's not as much about the, um, about the tools. So, of course, you have to have people who are really good at tools too, um, and we definitely have them as well, but... Uh, yeah, so to, to get back to your, your initial question, I think the, um, you know, the reason why we've stuck to those core, those, those core gameplay fundamentals is because we started in a, we started in a place where you kind of only had core, well, you know, retro gaming, I think is, is, um, it seems like right now it's described as something where you have like a retro art style, um, but I, I would go further as to say it's the, um, it's fun in gray box. You don't need a theme to it. Like Mighty Flip Champs had no theme. We pitched that as well. You know, what'd be really fun is I'll, this. This will make sense. I, I know I'm doing a huge, huge ramble, but I think I'll be able to wrap it up. Just, just watch. It's all. It's like I'm revving up for a stunt here. Um, the so like a game like Mighty Flip Champs. It's the the pitch was what would be the ultimate. Um, and it was actually a process, not a pitch. It was what would be the ultimate DS game. So the ultimate DS game would be something that uses two screens, they work together, there's some correlation between the two screens that will just be this amazing thing as the player figures out why this could only be done here on this system, right? So we were coming up with concepts that would be how could you how could you do this thing where you play on both screens but you don't have to look at both of them all of the time. And it was all figured out based on, well, it'd be fun to put a It'd be fun to put a gray box here and move it around to this position, and then have like a you know like when the when the barn the barn wall falls down in in your comedy sketch, and the guy ends up standing in one place, and the the window you know flops down on him. What if we could create that? Um, and that's and and that's what we did. Once we had a proof of concept, and we thought it was fun. You know, it was hey, well these things could this could be side view or it could be top view. The the tech doesn't care if it's a side view or a top view game. Um, well, let's make it a character climbing on ladders like a Burger Time kind of thing or um, or like a, uh, you know, like Donkey Kong or something like that. And it wasn't until later when we knew we were going to make the game, we knew we thought that we knew that it was fun, it was the entertainment we wanted. We're like, well, how can we put something on this that amplifies and makes it even more fun? Um, like some goofy characters or something like that. And that's why it ended up being a fish man. There's no reason it's a jetpack cat and a fish man and a girl and two pigs, or that could be cows. It doesn't make any difference. It's just that was, that was just a way to make it just a little more entertaining than make it be just a... A guy, a guy with a video game version of a of a job. It's like I'm, you know, Joe, uh, you know, I don't know, Joe guy with a job to do that involves ladder climbing, which, I, you know. Sure, anyhow, sure. That, that's that, one of the yeah. things I love about uh, your company is that you, you like, unlike a lot of indie developers who seem to be going out of their way to be like telling you what their message might be, mm -hmm. um, you guys are willing to throw in elements that seem to be just that amused you in the office, and you know it's oh, yeah. going to amuse me too, and it almost feels like uh, we're hanging out and I'm seeing what you're doodling mm -hmm. kind of in your margins. Yeah, I just yeah. drew a pig that looks like a cow, that looks yeah, like yeah. a pig. And that'll yeah. just be in the game, uh, and uh, it's wonderful to see that. Uh, how did I, I meant to, to backtrack a little bit. How did you go from uh, educational software back to being oh, independently yeah. run? Uh, how'd that transition? <laughs> well, um, so the, you know, the CD-ROM boom kind of came and went, and there was a point there where um, American Education uh, Publishing, I think, just decided it would be better to stick to books, and I'm, I don't, I'm not sure what they're doing today, but, um, but we, you know, we still talk to them every so often. They're, they're great people, and I think when we just came to, a, we came to a crossroads, it was like, well, we don't think we need the, the CD-ROM thing anymore, and we're like, well, we're kind of interested in going back and focusing on games, because for me, at this point, it had been 
a few years since we had done Super Nintendo and Genesis and Game Boy and Game Gear versions of that Mickey game, and we'd been doing kids CD-ROMs for a while, and I was really itching to get back to console. That's that's why I joined the, the company in the first place. And so um, when they had, there was an opportunity for them to just like, hey, we're going to let you guys um, just I basically. I mean, the short answer is we just got let go. It was we were part mm-hmm. of the we're part of the um, of this 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 new enterprise that went for a while and then they're like, well, nah, and then, you know, we, we, there were, I think, maybe, maybe six or seven of us at the time, if I'm remembering right, and we're just sitting around the, the conference table going, well, so there's going to be no more paychecks from our, our parent company. We are now on our own. What do we want to do? So we can either split up and all go get jobs or we just keep working here doing what we're doing. We're going to have to scramble and look for work. Um, so what we decided to do is, you know, we're going to, we're going to stick together and we're going to find jobs and these jobs are going to sustain us and they're going to give us paychecks and by night we're going to make the games that we want to make. So mm. by day we're going to do the stuff that pays the bills and by night we're going to do fun stuff. Um, which beautifully wraps uh, or like um, uh, not wraps us but like segues us into the um, the Kickstarter thing but we should probably mm. still put that off but that it's it's the amazing thing is it's been um, 15 or so years since then it's still the exact same conversations that are going on now. It's um mm. It's it's what do we do to pay to pay the bills regularly, and then it, when we can, you know, do this profitably, which it's not always done. You know, sometimes things go wrong on projects, and you just have to kind of eat it and get the game done. Um, and uh, but how can we keep this going, and and save enough that we can fund the games that we wanted to do? Because that's why we're doing it in the first place. Um, and that's what we did. So we started. Some of, some of you guys might remember some really old games, but um, when CD-ROMs or, or CDs, you know, they were getting cheaper and cheaper to manufacture. And so we did um, what do you call it? The uh, uh, parody interactive games. So there was these par- parody interactive. They were a subset of a company called Palladium, and we did X Fools and and Star Warped and Wind Blows '98. They were these again impulse buy CD-ROM products that were like Mad Magazine CD-ROMs in a box. So <sighs> Um, the, these things are, yeah, we should we should link you guys to some pictures, or I'm sure if you find them, if you just do a quick Google search. Wind but, blows. Wind blows 90, 95 or 98, whatever it was with the cl- with the clouds all over it, and there was a little, there's a Tamagotchi, you could raise Bill Gates, and you could feed him, and yeah. And, and, Sounds oh, amazing. Yeah, it was, oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's really. Wind blows 2000. I want wind blows Vista. This time. Oh, it was. <laughs> Make it. Yeah, and you had a, you know, there's a game in the, in the, um, Star Warped, where you could, you know, hit an Ewok with a stick and and all kinds of good stuff. All your dreams come true. And yeah, <laughs> did you run into any? And this was way forward on its own at this point. Still doing. Yeah, this was on this was on its own. Yeah, but these guys were. I I would compare it to the way the app market kind of is now. It's like, oh, that's funny. I'll buy that. Um, so people would just do that at the cash registers. You go to you'd go to GameStop, or I think it was still um, it was still Software, etc. I don't think it was GameStop yet. It was EB. Wait, what was it? E.B. Babbage's yep, Funko Babbage's, Land, right? Funko Land, right? Yeah, yeah. So those guys, um, uh, yeah, ridiculous. So you, they just make a game and they they box it, and they they were really clever about it too. They would ship the um, they would ship the box when they would go to, to manufacturing and they send it out to stores. They print it on the box. Um, put the it was an ad, but it looked like corporate instructions. It would say, "Place this next to your register." But it was like, hey, buddy, place this next to your register, not please place this next to your register, signed your corporate, you know, your parent company or whatever. Or whatever. And so people would get it, and they would, like, open it up, and they would, like, oh, yeah, I'll put it by the register, sure. And they put it up there, and then that's, I mean, crazy. That's how they made their money. So we made games for those guys. As, who was as, that? Who made the, who, who that was, was, that was, that was par- That was parody. Parody, and it was spelled like a parrot, you know, like a par- their logo, their mascot was a parrot. With Groucho Marx glasses, and um, we learned a lot of legal stuff from those guys because I had no idea what you were and were not allowed to do. But in the in the um, if you're making a parody or a spoof, you could do a lot. Mm. I had no idea. Um, yeah, parodies are. Yeah, that was a great. Yeah. Anyhow, so we had we had like a Pac Man that was X Files characters, and there was like the Fluke Man running around, and you were what were their names? It was like like Scolder and Mully or some. Silly thing, and you, yeah. And anyhow, these, yeah, these games are probably still out there. But we did that. We did a lot of stuff for SoundSource. SoundSource was, um, they did lots of. They weren't really educational games. They were entertainment products and for for kids. So we did. You remember when Casper was making his his movie come back? There were like Casper movies, 
and, and all that stuff. We did Casper games. We did Lost in Space. You know, all those, all, all that, all that era of movies. You know, things that were starting to make comebacks. We were doing CD-ROMs for that. And then eventually, the, um, you know, I think where we finally made our got got our, our healthiest transition was we're oh, and people will usually go, oh, you guys are a handheld company. The first ten ten years at least, we were all all PC. So our, mm-hmm. our first PC games, way, I, one I glossed over way back at the beginning, before we were, um, like when we were still in the educational company, partly, but had some still other stuff we do at night that was kind of more game gamey, um, we are doing Speed Racer. So we were making a Speed Racer, and it was it looked like Doom Speed Racer. So you're a car, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it was like, dri- you're driving, yeah, you're driving the Mach 5 um, around in this like very pixelated, you know, Kind of looked a little bit like Mario Kart. We did some of that stuff. Um, again, I'm I'm totally wow, derailed. That's amazing. We, we, you've we, worked we, on we, you've worked all the things Matt was on. I think we you've worked, worked yeah, on. I'm, Mickey I'm trying to think of, Muppets, yeah, I'm thinking of anything right yeah, there. Fake X Files. Fake hard Pac-Man. To come up with, uh, yeah, fake, fake Bill yeah. Gates. Jeez, fake Pac-Man. Louise. Yeah, fake, yeah, all, all of them. <laughs> Man, what what else? So we got to yeah. Where where do we go there? So once we oh yeah. So the big transition though was. Um, there's a point where we we've, this has happened a couple times in the in the history of our company, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm giving a very, you know, I'm giving you my story, so it's a little one, uh, it's a little one-sided, admittedly, um, but this is kind of how how I'm seeing it. There was a point in time where we had um, tons and tons of PC stuff. There was going to be more. You know, we did um, we did we did a lot of Marvel superheroes um, stuff that was like math and and reading and stuff, and you know, uh, we but we got to the point where I wanted to do. More original things. So I, I, I'd ask Voldy. By the way, Voldy Way is the, uh, the. I mean, I've worked. He's. I've worked for him for twenty something years, and I really do mean it. He's like the best employer you could imagine. There's, there's a point in time where I said, hey, we're doing a lot of things. That's like outburst for PC and like Hasbro type products, and we've done all the parody stuff and the educational stuff. I'm like, I'm really kind of burned out. I would love to do something Nintendo. Like I want to do Nintendo stuff. Like Voldy, can I do Nintendo stuff? And he's like, well, okay, yeah, okay. If you can do it, go ahead and do it. I'm like, oh. Really? I could just go ahead and try to do it? He's like, yeah, you could try to do it. So he just kept me on payroll, made some phone calls at Nintendo, said, Here, we're, here's a dev kit, um, see what you can do with it. And and I'm just clicking around on it, and it's all in Japanese. I have no idea. I'm not a programmer, I, it, not even remotely. Like I said, I had like someone had to help me get the computer. I don't even know how this computer was got this turned Game on. Boy dev kit? Or this a, yeah, this was, a, this was a Game Boy. This was a black and white Game Boy dev kit, and I was really excited because there was starting to be fewer Game Boy... Game Boy Black and White games on the market, they were starting to get pushed over onto those little rotary spinner things where you're like, they only displayed so many games at a time, they didn't even have a wall anymore. I'm like, I don't want to see Game Boy go away, I love Game Boy. Um, and the, I'm, I'm like, man, it's Princess Tomato and Salad Kingdom's the only game that's come out in like three or four months, there's got to be, we got to make more Game Boy stuff, right? So, um, yeah, it took like four months of messing with that kit and clicking on everything and playing around um, to try to figure out how to even get art on the screen. I think that thing's still in the in the drawer behind me. Um, but wow. we finally we finally did and, and, and they, they gave me a, a, a programmer and then a and then a second one to kinda help help out once we had more or less figured it out. And that led us to um, um, Extreme Sports. So Extreme Sports was the Wizard Works guys who be- oh man. Sorry, again when I go on these stories, you gotta bear with me. Okay, Wizard oh, Wizard, no. Wizard Works guys, the guys who were um, who are the, you know, like 2001 Doom levels and everything else, they had their breakthrough hit with um, Deer Hunter. So they were sitting on a pile of Deer Hunter money, and they're like, this is great, We've owned, we own the gaming now because we made Deer Hunter for PC. And they literally had, I mean, that game made so much money, I can't even tell you, it's ridiculous. And they wanted to branch out into different areas, and so they, they were like, hey, ESPN is, seems to be the new thing, let's make an extreme sports game for PC. So they, they, um, they hired us to do that. While we were working on the, the PC game, they thought, hey, Game Boy is um, they're gonna be, there's gonna be a new a new Game Boy system. They're gonna do Game Boy Color. Maybe you guys should get get on that. So we never ended up making a black and white Game Boy game, unless you count the um, the Mickey Mouse game we had made years and years ago. Mm-hmm. But that was like mm-hmm. that was way back. In fact, that game they even ported uh, somebody ported. It. I don't know who did it, but they ported it to Sega Master System. So I guess technically the oldest tech our, one of our games has existed on, other than PC, is probably the um, Sega Master System. I, I guess. So anyhow, I'll so, import it to Sega Master System. Yeah, because other territories, I, I, I heard this, I, I never understood this, but I guess other territories get the platforms much much later. Like, they, 
you know, sometimes like four or five years later, um, they they arrive in other countries. So, um, so they and then they have a need for new relevant products, and so people are still making them. I had no idea. So, um, yeah. So uh, where where am I with that? You so are the, on um, extreme sports. Yeah. So oh right, thanks. No, no yeah. So the yeah. So extreme sports. Um, with with Wizard Works, they they went into a transition. They they changed their name to Infogrames in the middle of that project, and then Infogrames just a, a couple of years later. Um, I could be blurring over. Maybe it was like five years later. I don't know. But they they purchased the name Atari, and became Atari. So th these guys, yeah. So we're making extreme sports. Who uh, for who in the future would be Atari? But at that point, they were Wizard Works. So we're making that game, and um, we did the PC one and the Game Boy Color one. And uh, they were awesome. They were like the craziest client I've, I've ever seen. They, the, the phone rang one day, like halfway through production. They're like, hey, how's the game going? We're like, oh, it's going really great. They're like, is there rock climbing? We go, no, there's not rock climbing, but there's, um, there's, there's loot, like street luge. And they go, sweet, see you in like four more months. Click. And that was it. I had one phone call from those guys <laughs> the entire duration of the project. And then they, then they got it at the end, and they, they call back again. And, they, you know, they're really just casual. They just wanted a cool game they could put on the shelf. They're like, yeah, how is it? Is it cool? Like, yeah, it's really neat. Like, we're looking at the game. It kind of looks like one of those po like Pokemon-type things now. What's up with that? You know, and I go, oh, I thought it would be kind of cool to put a quest on it. And is that okay? There's a quest in Extreme Sports? I, don't, I yeah. haven't played. Extreme, extreme Sports is a, Extreme Sports a little bit. Yeah, uh, all, yeah, Extreme Sports is a completely blatant Pokemon... Nod, rip off. Um, <laughs> where he run around this extreme sports island, bumping into um, extreme sports Simon trainers, and they want to battle you in street luge, right? And if you battle them in street luge, then you get their badges, and then you can go fight the. I'm not kidding, you guys. <laughs> this is like really horrible. And then you go fight the. Uh, um, I don't know, like the elite street luge guy at the end, and like save save the world, and that's what you do in this that game. That sounds incredible. So it, it yeah. takes kind of California game style thinking, yes. which is it, it's still pretty big in the '90s. And yeah. uh, I remember the Atari Lynx launched with California games, mm -hmm. and people bought it just for that. So just the idea of being able to play these uh, cool emerging new sports uh, in a virtual format made people feel like they were doing something extreme in their spare time, just playing you know old fashioned baseball. And you combine that with with Pokemon. Yes, so you could. Genius. Yeah, so you'd run around and you'd you'd bump into these very. It just looks just like Shantae. I mean, the 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 characters are the same, the tile sets are the same, everything looks about the same. You're running around, except it's top view. Um, you're running all over the world, and you're. Oh, by the way, we're we're probably going to put this. This isn't. This was not meant to plug that game. This is just part of the story. But I think we might try to get that on Virtual Console later, because oh, um, cool. we may we may as well. I we looked into. It, apparently, we the rights reverted, and we own it. So we'll we'll probably put it out there if Nintendo's into it, um, but but uh, but that would not that would not be anytime soon. That stuff takes a while. But um, but anyhow, yeah, you would you had um, you had skydiving and um, skateboard and uh, what was it? Street luge, surfing. What was the other thing? Rollerblading? Yeah, inline skating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, roller rollerblading is a brand name. And now that I said rollerblading, you should go buy some rollerblades. But yeah, inline skates, inline skates. Uh, yeah, that's how did that game end up doing? Uh, that was on PC and Game it, Boy Color, is that right? The, so the PC one was the PC one was supposed to be the main game, and it was like this Beavis and Butthead style, like animated game, <clears throat> and it came out, and it was it was cool and all, but it was the it was just like everything else. It was coming out as an impulse buy product. I think it was nine ninety nine or something, and then because I think it was just because I was so passionate about Game Boy and Nintendo stuff that when the um, when the Game Boy Color one came out, that was um, made a little more of a of a splash because Game Boy Color was brand new. We had a leg up on the hardware because we were we were hoping to do more black and white Game Boy, so we just kind of fell into the dev kit because Nintendo knew we wanted to do it. Um, so the game ended up being it ended up being huge. I mean the ridiculous that that you know uh, Wizard 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 Info Guratari um, wanted to. <laughs> Make they they were just like well what what do you need and we're like well how about this this cart looks good and it has has the eprom so you can save your game and they're like that's fine well turned out later people figured out no you don't buy the most expensive cart you you give the developers the cheapest cart that you could possibly make the game on so you can maximize your profit they didn't mm. do that they gave us the the grant the, the granddaddy of of all of all um, carts for both extreme sports and then we were kind of spoiled on it so we used it again for Shantae so that's why those games are huge and they have have the battery backup right 
So, uh -huh. um, yeah, in the end, I mean, that game takes, like, I, I couldn't even guess. It's, like, 100 hours to beat it. There's ton, tons tons, and tons of guys to beat. And then um, when we were done with it, oh, and, we, and that was one where, if you guys remember, Pocket, there were two magazines. Like, I think there were competing magazines, Pocket Games and Pocket Gamer. And mm -hmm. they both did some big, hey, here's a, here's a new, you know, a new company called Way Forward. And, and we're thinking, well, we're in our year, you know, 10 or 12 or something, but that's cool. Um, and they're doing this game. And so we did, you know, we showed that off. And then, uh, you know, uh, our, our CEO here, John, uh, John Beck, he's like, hey, we have this tech. Matt, why don't we do that game you've been trying to do forever, um, with the with the Shantae game with the hair whipping, right? And so... And that was funny. I'm like, ah, it's because it, that thing had lived in. I think there's piles. If can you see? Yeah, you can see these. This is yeah, this is this, this stuff is Shantae um, design doc. This these Whoa. these books uh, going from here to here was um, we we literally from from uh, '94 till 2000. Oh, geez, what would it be? 2000, 2000, I think. That that was just everything that that game was going to be. I think it was it was probably 50 different products before the one that actually shipped. Um, sometime I should just do a huge list of all the. Ridiculous games. Um, that's crazy. It's crazy. The, yeah, the, I want to hear about them. And, yeah. and what got you? What do you think birthed the idea of Shantae? And what do you think it is about Shantae that seems to mean so much to you that you've stuck with the character through well, highs and lows and through it, difficulties of even getting it done in the first place? I mean, it took yeah. how many years did it take between the, the Game Boy Color one and the DSi one again? Let's see. Between those two was I think six years. But between the Super Nint Nintendo Mickey and Getting the Game Boy Color one was eight years, so it was eight years wow. to get the first game out. And um, I think the reason why it's not it wasn't even about Shantae exactly, but uh, just some funny funny stuff on that and how that came about. Shantae was, um, you know, I, I think the I was just talking to my wife Erin about it, and and I'm like, yeah, how, we're because we're we're doing some other interview type stuff, and I'm I'm like, how did I'm trying to remember how that came about? And she, you know, she corrected me on a few things. She's like, well, first of all, Shantae spelled with a C, not an S, and I go, oh, whoops. I, I've been spelling it with an S for like, well, I oh, can't take that one back. Um, but she's <laughs> she's describing all this stuff because she she created that character. Um, mm -hmm. This was a thing where we're talking one time. I'm like, hey, you know, I was trying to encourage her, like, hey, keep drawing. We knew we met at Cal Arts. Um, that was uh, we we met there. We got married soon after. We we actually got married the week before I started at Way Forward. So um, that's it's it's pretty easy to count the uh, anniversary versus how long I've worked here because it's the same. Um, but uh, that character was, I just thought it was cool, and, you know, her very first drawings of it were really sweet and, and, and nice, and the, the concept that she had for it was that she, um, you know, she kind of liked, like, hey, let's do an I Dream of Genie type thing, and, and we were all, at that time, uh, our, our teachers at CalArts, they were, they were working on Aladdin at, during the day, and all of our animation classes were at night, and so they'd come back and they'd teach us all the stuff, they'd bring us to, to uh, to the studio tour, and they between like Little Little Mermaid, Aladdin, um, Beauty and the Beast, and Lion King. That was the four years that all of us were learning how to animate. So these are these are our teachers coming and pouring this stuff into a, into us, and and also I shouldn't just say Aladdin because it was also uh, Thief and the Cobbler, which has a, a similar ish art style. So these were heavy influences on Shantae. We're like, hey, we should do this for like for a video game is to um, like a cool Arabian Nights style thing. So she designed this character and um, she's like, I think it would be really cool if she had like this long hair and she could whip uh, monsters and destroy them with it. And then she would dance and she would be able to charm these animals and then they would like do what she needed them to do. Like go get that, go get that thing or crawl into that space or ram down this wall. And I, I forgot about that. And as we're working on our, our first proposal for it, um, I had made it that she, turned into it, into the creatures, because probably because I was all into Transformers, and so she, she's, I remember there were some pictures where we're, we're working together, and, and, and um, you know, we had our, our drawing table set up side by side, and we're comparing stuff, and I'm like, hey, you've got her riding a tiger, I've got the tiger actually, like, wearing part of her clothes, what, what's, what's going on, and she's like, well, she's going to ride the tiger, right, I'm like, oh, I thought she was turning into the tiger, so we didn't, you know, we never quite, I think that conversation got shelved, and then when we were on the Game Boy Color game years later, actually making it by then um, she was over at, at, at rough draft she was working on Futurama seasons one and two and had kind of moved like she had moved she had moved on and was doing other other stuff and um, and I was like I still want to make the Shante game happen you know dog on it and so I, I think at that point I had just sort of gone gone this direction with it and now she dances and turns into stuff um, 
but yeah, it's really fun. Just just even talking about it with her yesterday, we're, we're and reminiscing about all that stuff. It's 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 funny because those conversations don't seem all that old to me. And then you know you can kind of know the rest of what of how Way Forward went in the um, in the public eye is pretty well documented because we have um, you know Shantae that that came out and following that there were a lot of um, requests for handheld games and then the company shifted very much into let's start like the, I mean it just goes naturally everything with WayForward has gone very naturally the way that the um, the industry has gone the, the way the industry trends we've kind of just gone along with it and CD-ROM and PC development started to go down handheld markets started to go up the me and the other guy who were doing uh, it was Jimmy Huey who were doing the Game Boy stuff um, it was just the two of us we you know, Rob Buchanan, the original employee number one, he came into handheld and started helping. We did Scorpion King together. Mike Straggy, the guy who Kogu created Boogerman, he came on. He helped us build the Game Boy Advance team. And then we got big enough that we brought in um, uh, Armando Soto and Mark Gomez. These are both guys who you might you might talk to at some point. Um, uh, Armando now being our, our head of animation. And uh, we built, we started to split into more handheld teams. And then eventually, most of the company was handheld and there was very little that was PC. And and now recently we've done it again, where handheld is now about I'd guess maybe maybe it's less than half, and we're mm-hmm. branching out into um, we've got lots more console. Like we used to, you know three or four years ago before lit, we didn't have console games generally. We were trying to get into console, but we missed um, we missed N64, we missed PS1, we developed on PS2 and Xbox, but I don't those games I d- I think those games end up transitioning into. Uh, GameCube, but we were right on the line, so those uh, ended up. We we just ended up shipping products at that time. This is where we we're trying to extend huh. extend ourselves out of our comfort zone and do more stuff. And some of those worked mm-hmm. out well, and some some not as much. So, um, yeah. And how uh, many people are with the company now? Right now, there's we fluctuate between eighty and one hundred and ten. And wow. And, and just like just like before, the stuff that I'm doing now is um is. I'm the creative director of the company, but when I, I switch, I switch hats. It's just like it used to be. There's the main job to do by day, and that's 95% of everything we do is making games under contract. And then we'll like switch to the um, okay. Now back to what we're trying to do here, which is get our own original stuff to happen, and that's only 5% of our business. Um, mm-hmm. So when when we do that, it's just like it's just like back in the um, Game Boy Game Boy Game Boy Color days, because we still got everybody doing what they're doing, and and I think some of the people who are, are here or have not been here very long. They're not as aware of our of our passion for making original stuff, and they're kind of figuring it out after they've been here for, for a few months. Like, hey, what's always going on? It seems like there's always an original thing going on. There's some there's some um, uh, like I don't know like a like backroom project that's that's getting some love on the on the side. What is that? And it's because we're still trying to make that happen. Because just like the handheld days, we want to increase that. We would love to get it to the point where way forward is 50% original games that we create and 50%. Um, contract games that people ask us to make, because mm-hmm. if you look at the ratio of our games, um, boy, I think we're at. I, I don't. We'll have to post a list at some point all the games that we made over the years. But it's something like, I know it's over. We've been using the over 200 recently. Over 200 games. So well, I, I can't remember, but I'm 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 sure it's over 200 because years ago we made a list and it was over 100, and that's before we had a major boom in in work. It could be me- it could be much more than that, uh, but. I think in all that time, I think it's eight original games, and that's mm-hmm. that's with putting. All, I mean, Voldy is all about growing this place and having having more more original titles, and and self publishing is really important. Um, while while of course maintaining the the you know the core business, which is making games for our clients. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, that we're we're kind of doing it again. We're hoping that at some point we can keep that going. We're trying. This year, our goal was just to make more than one original game, because the last few years, if you go back to um, you know, Mighty Flip, well, Lit, Mighty Flip Champs, uh, Mighty Milky Way, Mighty Switch Force, um, Mighty Switch Force Two, and I'm sorry, I missed Risky's Revenge in the middle. And then this year, we've we've really, really gone nuts because we're trying to get, um, you know, this year was Switch Force Two, and it was um, Shantae and the Pirates Curse, and that's like as much as we can handle. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Do you think on top because of that, you're yeah. too, you're just so in demand for making games uh, the you know clients want way forward to, to make their game because you've mm. proven over the years that you're going to stay loyal to the the yeah. original concept but put out uh, a lot of original ideas that fit it is it because you're too you're too good that you keep getting all these jobs and you don't have time to, <laughs> well to make 
your own projects? That I, I hope that's why. I mean, some some clients have flat out just come in and said, "Hey guys, like with Batman: Brave and the Bold, we said they said we made a big list of all the developers, and we think you guys will do the best game possible, and it has to be way forward." Like, you know, it was essentially do do something amazing with this Batman property, and, and we loved it. I mean, we eat that up. We think it's so cool. And there are some licenses that, given the choice between an original game or a license, I would rather do the license. I mean, like it's not sure. always the original game is is better. There's like Duck, Ducktales is another example. It's I so what you wrote so the script for that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. I've wanted to do that since I was a kid watching the the show. I wasn't really a kid. I was like in. I was a senior in high school, um, but yeah, I, I was uh, like, "Congratulations oh, on that!" By the <laughs> way, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful script. And you did Aliens. You've worked on that. You've worked yeah, on Contra. You've worked on yeah. Blood Rain. You've worked on Double yep. Dragon. You've worked yep. on it's uh, it's unbelievable yeah. the amount of trust so many people put in to move yeah. forward to do right by their properties. Yeah, and I, I think that happens too because we're. Um, I mean, this the the industry, the game industry has has just devoured so many publish or uh, well publish I was going to say game developers but I suppose publishers too it's just mm. difficult and we have a really good survival instinct and I think that's because you know this is this is our our challenge is we're good at surviving so we know all right we have to put this original game aside and we have to focus on this thing that's paying the bills we have to we have to do it and we have to do it right now um and we do. And so our labor of love gets put aside and we work on the game and we make the game that we've been hired to make really great. And um, that and, and we and we I guess live to fight another day. And I think we are good at it. We are our games are generally our licensed games are generally rated pretty pretty well. Um, they're I mean, they're almost always going to be fun. If you open up a way forward game and it's based on a, a kid's license, I hope that even if you're an adult, you'd have a really good time because that's the way we approach it. We get really passionate about whatever game um, is is assigned to us. And not just speaking for me, but I'm I'm saying the teams themselves. You know, they might hear they're making like last year we did um, a handful of of kids games for like really young kids, and they get really into it. I mean, everybody's thinking, okay, this is probably the first game a kid is ever going to play. That, like, what do we want? Like, we're representing the entire game industry in this one product. What do we want to tell kids? How do we give them a love for gaming so they want to stick with it and play more games in the future? And uh, that that's kind of where we go. But yeah, we love we love the products. We we are very connected with the the player, and we're thinking about the audience all the time. And then the other thing is we're 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 local because a lot of the publishers are, you know, U.S. or southern Southern California based. So we're local. You, they, they can drive. People feel really good. I mentioned Penn Ward the other uh, a few few minutes back. But it's easy. They can just drive up to Valencia. We're just right off the five freeway. They come by and and grab a grab a chair and and join in or see what we're up to. It's very easy for them to. You know, stop by and kick the tires, and then, um, and then of course we're stable. <laughs> so since <laughs> since we're for a while, yeah, you've already yeah. worked on Kermit and Mickey Mouse, so you can handle yeah. Adventure Time and regular show. And one question yep. uh, I want to make sure I ask before I get because we've had a lot of questions that have come in from sure the people oh, watching. Oh, cool. Thank you so nice. much for doing oh, that's, that. That's great. Yeah, I'll get to those in just a sec. But uh, I've always heard that in general. Mm -hmm. When you deal with, like, with D3 Publisher, for instance, D3 has to get um, the rights to Adventure Time regular show, which yeah. costs them a certain amount of money. Yeah. And oftentimes they don't have a lot of money left over to, to pay a developer to make the actual game, which is why so many non-way forward uh, licensed games uh, don't always turn out so hot, because... There's no money left over. This is what right. I've always kind of heard. Is that uh, generally to be the case from from what you know? Does that happen a lot? Yeah, yeah, I could. Um, so D three in particular, um, I mean, they have been uh, phenomenal to work with. I, I've really and I've really enjoyed working with them. Um, I, I'm not sure. I would love to know, but I don't um, how how much they pay for those things. But I could speak to some to some other ones that are they're a little more easy to. Um, to get my head around because I was much much more aware of the financial type situations back then. Is mm -hmm. there there were games in the past, like especially in Game Boy Color era, and most of the licensing model is the same. So I'd assume it's very similar. Is that they would do a thing where they would um, they would pay a, they would pay a licensing fee, and it was uh, it's a lot of money. I don't know how much, but it was a, it was a lot of money, and they would they would say, okay, we're they're focused on selling the box. They're like, all right, this box we have they're. There, the problem on the on the um, publishing side in a lot of cases was, we have a we 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 know we can position the product.
which is a box with a picture of, of a licensed character in Walmart, which is going to, at this period of time, and that means we're going to get X amount of sales based on how well that property is doing or that property has a movie coming out or a Happy Meal promotion. So we think we're going to get this amount back, and we're going to put this much um, advertising in, which should spike it up to this amount, and they have it all worked out on a great big spreadsheet. And they're like, man, that was awesome. And then they go, okay, so one last detail um, before all this can go live is we need to make um, the game that goes in the box, right? So they've done all of that work, and all their financial model is set up, and they're ready to go. And they're like, okay, so anyway, we need a game. Um, so who, who, like, you know, who can we reach out to? And it's, and you know, we'll get a phone call, and, it's, and we're like, hello, what's up? They're like, yeah, so we got to make this game based on a movie. We, um, like, well, what do you have? What's the time frame, and what's the budget, and kind of what are you thinking? And and sometimes it's really nice, and they say, well, what it is. We'll work with you, like way forward what you guys think it is, and that's usually how it goes. They let us pitch whatever we think it is, and we base that on well, how much money do you guys have have for development, and um, how much time is left. And in some cases, I I am not exaggerating when I say there have been games where, um, uh, thankfully not one in a long time, but there have been games where it was well, we only have about six to eight weeks. And we have to make a game because there's a launch of a console or a, or a new not a console but like a new product. Um, mm -hmm. And we need that game. We need that game done now. Can you guys do anything? And in in cases like that, um, we're extremely hesitant because we don't. Our reputation is based on stability and delivering really good products. So mm -hmm. what we'll do at that point is say we might get a little more into it and ask, how much is this going to cost? The like, what are you going to charge for it? And are you guys willing to let us do something like? Um, you know, take a take a like. Let's say we have a really good action platforming thing going, and we could um, leverage some of what we have built already, and say, well, you know, essentially, what if we cannibalize one of our internal products, and mm -hmm. and we could that's a way of getting a game done. Um, thankfully, that doesn't happen as much anymore. Like in the this is you know in the case of um, of D three, they've given um, a, a a good amount of time and and healthy budgets for these games, and I think that's that's why. Um, I mean, it's like everything else. There's still a crunch. I mean, there's there's people just cramming to get those games to be everything they can be in and really, really reach their potential before they ship. Um, but that's a case where, you know, here, it's, it's easy if you think of it this way, just speaking to the timing of it. Um, these games tend to come out seasonally, so every holiday season there will there will be a new, um, you know, SpongeBob or Barbie game, and, you know, we've done a ton of those. Mm. Um, well, if a comfortable development time is 12 months... You can't, and and you can't because it has to. Like what happens is, okay, let's use the let's use the SpongeBob example. The game comes out. Um, let's say it comes out for Black Friday, and then by um, first quarter, uh, maybe around um, January, February, they're they're going, okay, was this a, su a successful product or not? All the the because pub publishers are risking a lot of money. Like they're they're manufacturing, they're shipping this thing all over the world, and they're they're hoping that they recoup. And so they're looking at it, going, are we going to get are we going to get our money out for what we put in? So they might know by March. Okay, this was successful. We should do another SpongeBob game, um, and uh, and then they'll reach out to us again, and they'll say, "Yeah, way forward. You want to make a game?" And we're looking at at the clock and going, "Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We want to do another one. That was a blast. But how much time is left?" And sometimes you've eaten up some of the some of the time frame, and that because they want to buy Black Friday again the next year. Yeah, and it's important. And, and, and got to be done before November yes. too. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they, and they need to because that's when most of the of the um. You know, physical products make their make their money. So um, you totally totally get it. When you start thinking about a game that has to come out, you know, the new game should be coming out every single year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that's why that timing tends to happen. So uh, when you were, um, I'm going I'm going back to the uh, the initial question though, because I think I I think I went so far down that path. Um, oh no, that was great. That was very informative, and uh, very few people but, are. You were asking though, that inside track. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and um and and understand too. That it's always um, did I just unplug? I think my headphones just popped out. Um, yeah, it's always it's it's always uh, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of common sense involved. You know, we mm -hmm. these these people are these people are very smart. You know, we're talking to them on the on the phone or getting getting together in person. We're discussing what we can reasonably do in the amount of time and with the budget going on. Oh, which was I think the question you were asking initially is the. Um, how do they, you know, so much money going to the license? Um, you know, sometimes uh, I, I'm not sure what all their arrangements are, but in some cases, you know, maybe they're maybe they're uh, paying for the license based on how well the product does. Maybe the licensor is getting a percentage. I, I don't know how it goes, um, but 
something that that we might want to touch on briefly because it has so much to do with our Kickstarter is way forward when we like here a picture of way forward at a at a healthy you know so you guys know we are independent in other words there's no there is no parent company if um if we're working on uh, if we're working on our game and we fall behind and we don't make a milestone and the and now we've pushed our our next payment you know it's basically like getting an allowance um, if we don't clean our room, we don't get paid, right? So if that if that doesn't show up, I mean that's where the money comes from. So when a project is done, like when we finished Ducktales, I saw some comments like, "Hey, you guys just shipped Ducktales, so you guys probably have a, a money bin full of cash you can go swim through because now you're rich, right?" And it's like, no, we just finished Ducktales, so our funding ha- is gone because that game's mm-hmm. done, right? When we're working yeah, on it, know, we're getting sure. Right, the people, I, I guess, people aren't aware of that. Uh, you were being paid to make the game, yeah. like going to work, and, and then when the game's done, it's like your job's done. Yes, we are contractors. Right. Yeah, contractors, just like if you if you hired a contracting company to come in and like paint your house. So like when when you they come in and paint the house, it's, you know, you're lining up all this stuff, how much is it going to cost, how much is your square footage, when do you need it done by, that might be a rush, there may be some parameters at, at, at play there. Um, it's exactly the same here. Then we come in, we do our magic, and we do the, the best job that, you know, that is possible given all of the parameters, and then we get out. So we're, we're done. Like, at that point, we're like, well, last check just arrived from the, you know, from the game we did. Um, better start looking for work. And so we, we hit the bricks, and we start making calls, and, and that happens all the time. And what's different now um, compared to a few years ago, you guys remember every kid's show or toy line had a... Nintendo DS game. I mean, it didn't matter, or Game Boy Advance. It didn't matter what it was. If there was a show, if a, if a kid could see a commercial for it, there was going to be a DS game or a Game Boy Advance game. Um, but that's not the case anymore. So now, some of them have them, but they don't all. Um, so I guess I guess what I'm saying is the 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 change the change in landscape has been um, has been I, uh, iOS and the app market. So. Mm-hmm. They can experiment and find out if somebody wants a product, and with you know, like a 99 cent game, rather than a manufactured 30 or you know sometimes 35 dollar physical product. Because you've you've seen this all the time. I'm sure if you guys go to the, you know, frequently go down the game aisle and you'd see stuff like, oh, here's a, um, you know, take one that that you know we might have worked on. Um, like here's here's one based on a kid's toy, and it looked good. And maybe you look at the re- reviews, and and they're pretty good. Like, hey, that's pretty good for what looked to me to be a um, almost like a disposable kids kids game meant to last one season, and then it's in the bargain bin and it's seven ninety nine or something, and they're just trying to get rid of them and they can't give them away. That doesn't happen anymore because of digital dis- distribution. Um, mm-hmm. But similarly, because that doesn't happen anymore, there aren't as many of those games, and those were our bread and butter for about a, a good eight year stretch. So now there's things where it's um, you know, like a game like Ducktales. I, I'm guessing I, I won't say anything out of turn, um, but because I'm guessing Austin already probably covered all of this stuff. But that was a long pitch process. Um, that wasn't that wasn't a hey guys, we got this. Game. Sometimes other games go this way. We have a game. We waited too long. We needed it out for holiday. Would you please make it? There's only five months left. What can you do? Ducktales wasn't like that at all. Ducktales right. was a um, was a hey we've been thinking about this for a few years and kicking it around and we know you guys are into Disney stuff and you've been talking about it because we've been pitching some some uh, Scrooge related things for a long time I've been actually after a Scrooge game since the Mickey Mouse game back in in '93 so this is really? uh, I'm I'm really excited we got to do that um, but uh, yeah I guess the you know in that case there was a long setup now <laughs> there are plenty of games I'd say talking to the I'd have to talk to the other other designer directors too and get a more concrete number, but we probably pitch around, uh, maybe around in the neighborhood of 20 games a month where we write documents, make visuals. Um, I'd say every year we do a few of them that have demo to them. Um, some of them, uh, maybe one, maybe one or two per year that are as meaty as the Shantae Half Genie Hero one you see on our Kickstarter right now. We're not getting paid for that stuff, so that's where we're taking the the you know, if we if we've been able to eat, to save up some some cash from you know five or six projects we've been doing throughout the year, um, which we usually have about six going on at once. Um, that that seems to be our magic number: six contracted games that we're working on. There's like six teams, and we're making these games. We get to the point where um, we need to go after a big a big fish. Like, oh, here's a, here's a one. Oh, we really want to make that game. Um, let's let's get in, and we're we're pitted maybe against a few other developers who all want the job. And so we're making a demo, and we're spending money, and we're doing proposals and things and um, 
you know, I'd say, uh, I mean, out of those, you know, dozen or, or a couple dozen, I, I think if you look at our, our folders of, you know, in our desktops, here's all the business development and pitches and game proposals we've been doing just in the last year alone. I mean, you're going to see dozens and dozens of games that, that did not take off after months of work and, you know, we have a lot of artists here who have made some beautiful stuff that we can't show because it's for games that didn't didn't take off. Right. Um, so though that costs so much money, I'd say on on average we probably spend more than uh, you know pro probably more than one you know one original internal game's worth of funds just to secure the next project, and that's being passed you know passed over for. A, a handful of them. So mm -hmm. yeah, while while we get yeah, we are a sought after developer. We hear frequently, hey hey, you guys are at the top of our of our list on the on the whiteboard at the at the publishing place, and that's awesome. But a lot of times it's that the publisher has a great idea, they really want to do it, and then for some reason they can't because the TV show that they were working on um, that got canceled, or they're like, oh yeah, no, they're putting their focus on a, di a different show this year, so we're not going to be able to do that particular um, that particular thing. Um, and all those things add up. So, um, yeah, we're. Uh, I guess what that means is, you, you'd. It's not only the fact that a game ends and there's no more income, but we also have to leverage any money we're hanging on to to try to impress and secure the next game, you know, by whatever means necessary. And until we're under contract, that's not paying for itself. And we're and it's not. Um, it's not a case where we're keeping a running total of how much we spend to get the game, and then when we sign the contract. It's not like they go, "Oh, and here's for you know, here's all the here's all the money for what you spent." There have been a couple of cases where some some of the larger publishers have said, "Hey, we're going to fund a prototyping phase, and um, we'll work all that stuff out in that phase." That works great when they can do that, um, but it's not typical. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so the usually, money it costs you to win them over. You don't get. Uh, no, that's just, yeah. No, that's yeah. just the and and that's and that's not something we're complaining about. It's just the cost right. of, of doing business. It's just how it's sure. done. So, yeah. And, it's, and uh, I want to make sure that I ask uh, the two things. I want to make sure I get to you before. Oh, we only have 18 minutes left in the show. Oh dang! I talked a lot. Talked about, hey, you did great. It's, oh, it's thank been, you. Uh, I've been riveted. Uh, two things. Mm -hmm. And then we'll we got to make sure we talk about Shantae at the end. So yeah, I can't believe that. you're you're kickstarting. Four hundred thousand dollars for a game that, uh, <laughs> with that level of fluid animation and that level of ambition in terms of content, uh, I'm I'm floored. You could have asked for so much more, and hopefully would have gotten so much more. But the uh, fact that <laughs> well, I don't know if you guys, if you're familiar with Robert Rodriguez, but I often think of Way Forward as kind of the Robert Rodriguez of oh, sure. game development. That you guys can <laughs> somehow, with a hundred dollars on your credit card, you can make like a whole yeah. Uh, a whole game. Uh, yeah. But anyway, uh, Adam Tierney mm -hmm. sent me some talking points. Oh yeah, go for, go for it. Best. Uh, I'm not going to get into too many of them because I can't open my email without uh, lessening my CPU's processing power and making mm -hmm. the stream look even worse. So, but I do remember him saying that he thought that Sabrina, mm -hmm. and I believe he meant Sabrina the Teenage Witch, yeah. was an influence on the direction of Way Forward. In general, and maybe way forwards uh, original games in particular. Oh, is that accurate? Uh, a little bit. He's he's yeah he's close. There's um uh, so what was going on in the <laughs> in the Game Boy Color days? So we as soon as we finished that extreme sports game, <clears throat> excuse me, we had uh, we started on the Shantae game almost right away. So people would come to the office like, hey, show us your tech, and so we'd show them this magical girl thing, right? And more often than not, they, they, what would come up is, oh, we have a magical girl license that we want to do. Um, we're doing. Uh, that's why there were, you know, there were two Sabrina games. We had a couple of um, Barbie on Game Boy Advance, and we, yeah, Sabrina one and two, and then we did Wendy the Witch for, you know, the Harvey license. Mm -hmm. um, we did those. Let's see, am I forgetting something? For a while, it seemed like everything we were doing was either some magical girl game, or we were doing a. Uh, we did um, WWW. Well, I guess it was WWW. E but or F betrayal. I'm trying to remember what they called it then. WCW yeah. Mayhem. WCW Mayhem. We worked on. Um, that was the Game Boy Color, and then we that went straight to um, Scorpion King. So it seemed like people were getting this idea that well, if it's a if it's like a big sweaty dude with punching <laughs> punching with his his meat hammers, or if he had a, a big sword and he could like slice people, or if it was a magical teenage girl, that's your that's way forwards sweet spot. Like go for one of those. And and of course you know now we're much more versatile than that. But um, that is a thing where I just think there was a natural 
progression. I mean, once we, by the time we had done all that Game Boy Color stuff and Shantae came out, it was the first one to start, but it was the last one done. Um, by, the time, by the time that game came out, we were starting to get a reputation of people going, hey, these games are really good. We like your Sabrina games. We like your, um, we like your Wendy game, and I love that Wendy game. I think it's so much fun. And it was, again, uh, like Extreme Sports being a, a, a total nod to um, Pokemon. You know, that one was Metal Storm for NES. You know, we're like, no one's going to play Metal Storm, but maybe we could turn... Um, Wendy the Witch into like a Metal Storm game. That's why it's a gravity flip game is, is to, to take something that we thought was cool and reinvent it. And so, uh, yeah, we ended up doing lots of lots of Magical Girl games, and it, it seems that that's just kind of been... It's just continued on. I mean, most of them, most of them now, the original games are uh, are are all... I think they're all female. Well, no. Oh, there's we got, yeah, yeah, we got... Yeah, yeah Jake is... Uh, yeah, yep. So, Yeah. I actually like pause for a moment on Jake. I'm like Jake, yeah. <laughs> Not to be confused with. with I thought you meant uh, with, Jake Coffin. Yeah, yeah, that's what I know. My brain actually hiccuped on that. I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, yeah, Jake from. Lake. Oh, one thing I wanted to ask: mm-hmm. Would you ever be able to put? You know how in Animal Crossing, uh-huh. the composer for uh, Animal Crossing is kind of in the game. There's a guitar playing dog named yeah. Tito KK. Yeah. Could you ever put Jake Kaufman in one of your games, just playing all the different kinds of music he plays? Yeah, we probably. He's an irresistible character. I would yeah, love that. We probably could. I don't know if you guys saw. There's a YouTube video where there's like a pixel J. I don't know if you guys know uh, Jake does pixel art, and it's pretty good. Really? Like he's got yeah. There's a pixel Jake um, talking about uh, talking about Shantae in one of the YouTube videos that I think it's oh, I think it's hosted on the Way Forward site. Yeah yeah, 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 and it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I think that, yeah, if we did that, I'd probably use that that Pixel Jake as a base and use it, because yeah, that's that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of neat. Because yeah, in the in the old games, I think we had a few of those. We have Extreme Sports is loaded with Way Forward employees as crowds, you know, all throughout. Um, my wife Erin is in there, and I think there's uh, our Sharif Morse, our producer um, back then. He's in there, and then if you go to the Shantae Game Boy Color, you've got me as the depicted as creepy clown. Bald clown in a, living in a cave, you know, and then and then uh, Jimmy Huey is the as the technical guy. He's the guy who unlocked the Game Boy Advance transformation for you. Um, that's mm. that's him, and and he's in there. So yeah, we've we've a couple times we've we've stuck people in the games, um, and that'll be fun. Yeah, Jake should probably be in there. I think he's 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 due because we've been working with him okay. forever. Yeah, what, so, 13 years yeah. or more than that? Yeah, he worked um, on, yeah, he was on the original Shantae, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and people always want to know, and I'm always curious to hear it again or hear more about it, mm-hmm. the fact that with your original games, you have struck with uh, c- cute, likable, but not necessarily sexualized female protagonists, yeah. which is incredibly rare. I've always guessed that <laughs> that had something to do with your wife's influence creating Shantae and Shantae yeah. kind of being the um, blueprint for uh, all of uh, uh, Way Forward's original characters. But well, why is it that you've stuck with Shantae and with Shantae-like characters for so long? Well, I think uh, I mean part of it was that it was a frustrating thing for many years. I mean, we had um, well, I guess the, the core is we, I, I mean, I personally like characters like that. Um, I think it's. I, I, I do think that they're that they're cute and charming, and um, and uh, y- you know they're 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 just very in, endearing, and um, they're they're intended to, they're intended to be attractive. But I guess I never had. Um, I always liked. Um, I don't know. I was never as in, into the um, the the right down the middle superhero thing, which is you got to have your five your five strapping superhero dudes on the team, and you can have your your one your one woman character, um, you know, even though I like a lot of shows like that, I, I grew up with tons of them, but um, sometimes you'd have that episode where they put the spotlight on the female character, and those were really cool, and I think I always liked, mm. you know, it, later I always thought stuff like Sailor Moon was cool, I liked anime stuff, I thought that was neat, I loved, there were games I never really quite got to play, but I thought the Valis series looked kind of interesting, but I didn't oh, have the, to, yeah, they, yeah, they're great in concept, yeah. not that fun. Yeah, and Did you ever watch Project Echo? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Me and Rob used to watch Project Echo back when Way Forward was starting up. And we're like, this is cool. This is like really different. And then another like huge, huge thing that can't, like I cannot um, uh, emphasize enough is we at CalArts we, we were passing around Studio Ghibli films. So mm-hmm. 
no, that was, those were not distributed in the U.S. yet, so they were all in Japanese, and they were they were um, ones that people had just you know copied from one place to another, and they're on VHS tapes. And um, at, at that time, people were like, "What are these movies? They're like incredible." And and if you look at those, most of them are women characters, like female characters. It's Kiki's Delivery Service, and uh, um, in um, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm throwing to, yeah, to, yeah, yeah, Totoro, all all of them. Thank you. They're yeah, I'm I'm actually sad that I that I. I choked on their names because I watch them all the time. I mean, we. Oh, I believe it. So, yeah, it's just, so yeah, they're, they're, they're interview yeah. Show. It's hard to. Think yeah, no, it's it, it is. It's a little a little tough to recall everything. And um, and you guys know I'm huge hugely uh, a fan of of Samus. I, I love Samus, mm -hmm. and I, my you know as a as a youth, my mind was blown. You know when she was you know kind of desuited like Ripley at the end of Aliens. I'm like, oh my gosh. So um. Yeah, but Mega Man Legends yeah. three framed thing. Up I there, do. Too. That was a that was a gift. Hey, how people have asked about that. Is that like am I is that a um, is that some kind of jab? It's not. It's not a jab. I just love. Oh, I love Tron Bon too. I don't even know if I'm saying her name right. Um, so I know. I've never known if it's Tron Bonnie or Tron Bon. Or Tron Bon. Yeah, I love, yeah. Everyone. Yeah, so Bonnie, I don't know. I I thought it was the Bon family, but if I'm wrong, please write me an angry email and let me know. But I just love the character design so much. Um, but yeah, the female character thing. Um, the uh, you know at the beginning, my goodness, you would not believe how hard that was. Um, we we lost. We had opportunities, I think, to get the Shantae project rolling for a while, and. Um, you know, there were there were plenty of conversations with, uh, you know, with with a young game industry. You know, people who had had some money and would have to take a colossal risk, you know, to get the game manufactured and into stores. And they would ask some tough questions. They're like, "Hey, we got to ask you, have you considered making it a male character instead? Because this is a male audience. They're, you know, you got to put a guy. You know, we don't know. It's never, you know, it's never been proven that a a, a male dominated audience will accept a, a female character." Especially when it looks like this, she's just, she's not tough. She's just this unsuspecting, you know, uh, belly dancer. Yeah, 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 and and yeah, and, and you know, we were. T I think we were taking on. There were too many things at that time that were that were risky. Um, it's just funny. Um, it was it was a female character. It was a. Yeah, it was a it was a dancing game, and this was when we were pitching this. There was no DDR yet, so we were saying, "Yeah, we want this to be something where you have to have some rhythm, and there's like a beat to it in order to transform." And they're like, "Oh, it's hard to understand what that would be like. What if somebody can't get get that concept?" We're like, "Well, we think we can teach it to them," and and mm, I don't know. And it's a girl, and a couple of times they're like, "Well, if you put, if you put um um even a male character and have it be a selectable." You know, you could play as the male character or the female character, or maybe you unlock the female character. We're like, no, this is what this game is. We want it to be about this. This is this is her. This is her game. And um, you know, I think that the game industry has has, you know, it's matured in a lot of ways, and in a lot of ways it hasn't. And and mm -hmm. I think that um, you know, we owe we owe a lot in in weird ways um, that are kind of hard to describe, but to things like Tomb Raider because. To, you know, when that game came out, I saw some people start to soften up. Mm. And they were like, well, I get. I mean, that game sold pretty well. Yeah, I guess maybe. Um, you know, and then it's like questions of, well, could you make her sexier looking? Maybe she's older. You know, could you, does it have to be, um, you know, can she be more of a, of a fierce warrior? You know, mm. what can you do with that? I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. I kind of want to stick with what it is. And so I think that finally when that game came out, you know, and I, and I really, really am, am always... Um, Ready to to plug Capcom and, and thank them so much because they they believed in it. I mean they were they were just completely got behind it and they're like yeah we want to see this game succeed and and I really appreciate that and I think that um you know it's very much in line with what they were doing at the time. I mean they had Resident Evil games that featured female characters and well yeah they were selectable. I think they were they were recognizing that a lot of people were interested in playing as female characters. So um, I think that's why the the Mighty series and the original games have had female characters. It's been suggested we would never do a male character, but I, I don't. Um, that's there's no rule. We would do a male character if there was a if. But if we're gonna do a male character, it better be unique and special. It can't mm -hmm. be. You know, we we made we made jokes about you know maybe maybe it's a male character and he's got like a score to settle and his arm is like a robot arm, you know it's like well, and he's like full of witty witty quips. I mean that won't be enough. We'll have to do do something really really unique. And so I want to do stuff that's special and unique and that's not not immediately something you would just compare it to. Oh, it's just like that thing. They just did that, you know. So right. that's, that's what that's I liked about Jake so much. He was a really vulnerable relatable high school you know, just a regular yeah. guy and I I, had, uh, I think I had been told oh, I can't talk more about it because we only have four we have oh, six sorry. minutes and there's so many questions oh, not, okay, your, yeah, not yeah. your phone uh, it's been great Shantae no 
one quick question about Chante mm-hmm. that I've always wanted to ask. Okay. Um, to me, the Castlevania series is very much about negotiating the distance between uh, whoever's whipping and whoever's getting whipped, and how you yeah. have to get them, you have to let them get close enough that you can mm-hmm. whip them to hurt them. But once they get that close, they become a more immediate threat. So yeah. it creates all this tension like automatically. Yeah. Was that something you wanted to do with Shantae, or was was Shantae? Already uh, going to be hair whip because that was kind of the the design of the character no, it, and the concept of the character. Yeah. No, it was not. It was uh, a couple of things on that because um, people wondered where if there were other game influences. Um, here's here's the quick the quick answer. Um, yes, totally inspired by Castlevania because I was a huge Castlevania nut on the NES. Um, like the first three of them, thought it was like amazing. Mm-hmm. And yeah, she was directly inspired by that. And if you guys remember the Game Boy Game Boy Black and White era, they did. Um, Let's see. Castlevania Legends for a while looked like it was going to be the last Castlevania. There was a, there was a long. I, I think I got my timeline right. Someone again, someone can correct me, but there was a long period of time between. It looked like the series was done and nothing was going on. I'm like, I, I need, I need some Castlevania, and it doesn't seem to exist anymore. And so we started building this, this thing that was very similar. We're like, well, we'll be the. Um, I think the way I thought of this in my head at the time w- was. We will be the Parodius to the the Gradius or Gradius series. We'll be that for the Castlevania series. We'll make a, a, a sillier, lighthearted, um, like our version of that, since that seems like it's going away. If Castlevania is going to be a footnote in history, I, I don't want to see it go. Um, and that's why right. it, has the, it has the day and night cycle, you know, just like Simon's... Um, Questions sure. and stuff like that. Cute Medusas, scary yeah. uh, scarecrows yeah. that are still that, cute. Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly that's exactly why. So yeah, and the, and the hair whip, and also I had played Kabuki Quantum Fighter, and I thought that was pretty cool because that was a hair whip game as well. Um, but this was also um, this was pre Donkey Kong Country with the with the hair whipping girl or any or oh, mon- right, right, monkey right. monkey girl. So yeah, hair whipping started to become a thing, and you know we watched with horror as it would gain popularity on other characters. So like, but our game isn't out yet. Oh my gosh, people are gonna think we ripped it off. The big one though is I was shocked. Um, people have made made um, made comparisons to Monster World for a while. Okay, I played mm-hmm. Monster World with uh, everybody else who played it for the first time last year when it came out on. Um, uh, on PSN, and you know what I'm talking about? The, there's I think a so. My, okay, so like, um, wow, Monster World 4, it is it is so, so, so similar. Uh, I, I got the email address of the, the guy who created the Monster World series, and I, I really need to talk to him because it is freaky. Um, the way the, con- the, the coins bounce on the ground, and the way the character moves, and the, the color palettes, and the Wow, so much stuff Just about Monster it. World Four. I played Monster World Three, I think, mm-hmm. but not Four. Yeah, it's it is it is very 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 similar, and it is it is um it is a coincidence unless there is some way that I could have seen, you know, unless there's some way in a Japanese bookstore if I had opened up a magazine and saw, saw maybe a single image, it's possible. What I think is more likely is that we both were probably cr- on a, some crazy Legend of Zelda is amazing. Cause Link to the Past is like my favorite game of all time, and that had come out and um. Aladdin had just come out um, in movie theaters and was, you know, amazing. And uh, I have a feeling we both kind of had similar influences and just did our thing. That's my sure. guess. But yeah, no. To to speak to that, I had I had not actually played that game until um, last year, and I love it. If you haven't had a chance to play it, like go check it out because it's really really good. It's so, on PSN. Yeah, yeah. You can get a PSN or Xbox. I think it's packaged slightly differently. One's a, you know, but. Um, but yeah, and and the main difference is one is one has a, she has a sword. I forgot her name. I'm sorry, but uh, yeah. it's just it's just so good. So yeah, uh, we have two minutes. Mm-hmm. This is gonna be amazing. We're gonna do this. We're gonna change the way people think about answering questions at the end of okay. TV shows or uh, <laughs> internet shows because we're just gonna do it. Okay. Uh, Trunky Junkie asks, any ETA on the release of Shantae's Risky Revenge on Steam? On Steam, we're going to. Um, uh, assign somebody to that task. We expect it's going to take a few months, and that's all I know. I'm not sure who's doing it, but we are um, for sure going to put it on Steam. People have that keep, Steam. Oh, and sure. I forgot to ask uh, mm-hmm. when you said things have changed, and it's often about iOS uh, mm-hmm. and 99 cent games. Yeah. Would you want to start churning out 99 cent games of that model uh, in order to you know keep paying the bills? <sighs> yeah, may- maybe. But right now, it seems like our original game focus is kind of going towards. Um, the the handheld and console, mm-hmm. so those it might be that these games at some future date get ported to iOS and Android, but I'm not sure. 
Right. Uh, that, I guess mm-hmm. that's still, yeah, kind of still in flux. We have, you know, we have Risky's Revenge on iOS. We do some work for higher stuff on iOS. Mm-hmm. Um, so I imagine once that is something we're, you know, really good at, that's some, maybe that's when we start doing it more for ourselves too. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll stay tuned on that. Aqua Draka asks, "What is your dream property to make a license game out of?" You can only like three or four words. Is Mega one word or two words? <laughs> Yeah, the, the yeah. mighty number nine uh, Kickstarter happened yeah, yeah. right when uh, your I know. Kickstarter I, happened. Who, who, uh, yeah, who, who knew? We didn't. We didn't know. That's a question that's been coming up a lot. Did you guys know? No. We hit our when we hit our countdown button. Like, yeah, next Wednesday it's gonna be awesome. And then we're like, well, what could happen? And and we actually we we're sitting around at lunch joking. We're like, oh, like you know what would be crazy is what if Inafune made a Kickstarter? Like that would probably be the thing that would like if as long as something crazy like that doesn't happen over the next two to three days, we're golden. And and then sure enough, I mean, you would not believe. I, I mean, like jaw dropped. I'm like, hmm. no, are you kidding me? <laughs> so um, yeah, but I, it seems like I'm just hoping like that game gets funded as as much as it needs to, and then maybe we get some of the attention after that because you know that guy is like my hero. So I'm not. It's there's I think no there's uh, room for both of you. And from what I've heard, the rumor yeah. I've heard, Mighty Number no. Nine is going to be polygon based graphics. And oh really? I okay. Substantiate that. So I'm oh, guessing. Okay, sure. Once more comes out about how your game's going to look and how get their game's going to look, people are yeah. going to see uh, they're they're separate enough yeah, that you're yeah. going to want them both. Yeah, timing. Uh, crap, we're over time already. Rats, can we do these questions? Is Sinistar going to let us do them? Uh, he hasn't yet. Maybe he's sleeping. <laughs> As so I'm, we're I'm, just gonna I'm, not, I'm good. Uh, if you want to, if you want to keep going, we can always edit out some of my. Well, you can't edit out. No, 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 no. It's live. No, we won't yeah, edit you, anything out. Yeah. It's all perfect. Uh, Cast right. the gamer guy cool. asks, "What is your favorite game out of the ones that you have designed thus far?" Are. It's like your favorite child. Okay. Or your favorite, you know, moment in life. Right. It's very hard. Okay, my favorite but, yeah. yeah, the favorite game that I like hands on directed. I've directed a handful of the games here. Um Contra Four is probably my favorite. Um but um Shantae the original Shantae is kind of the most special. Mm. And that's kind of a weird answer, but the one was, you know, Shantae was me and family and it was close and, and it's very special to me, and it was the a huge, huge triumph. But Contra Four was like the oh my gosh, I'm finally getting to do the dream, the dream branded like franchise game I've always wanted to do. So um, and that game did pretty well, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it yeah it sold more than uh, than I think it was expected to to sell. And I sure, wish um, they would give you Contra Five if you would do it. I mean, maybe you put all your ideas into Contra Four, but that would be wonderful. Oh for no, me. no, we we held the we held a lot of stuff for in the hopes that there would be a Contra Five. So um, yeah, there's 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 plenty to do there if it ever comes mm. up. Exciting. Yep. Hopefully that'll pan out. Uh, Blazerman asks questions from a Skullgirls fan. Sure, yeah. And uh, Way Forward has some connection to Mario Kart, right? Is my yeah. understanding. So he's Calar too, I yeah. think. Uh, who is the lead animator on Skullgirls? Right. Will shall be a guest character in Skullgirls. Uh, Mike C, uh, the creator of uh, Fighting Game, mentioned your Kickstarter and interested in it. That would be yeah. fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I would love to see Mario uh, head up. Yeah, I would love to see that too. Yeah, Mariel, we've known her for a while. Um, uh, again, my only the only the one perspective I've got is one uh, at career day, career wow, career day at CalArts um, a few years ago. I actually went there and um, yeah, we went through all the portfolios. Uh, and they lay them out. There's like you know tons of them. I'm like this person is is the uh, like has the has what we're looking for at, at way forward, and it was Mariel. And so mm-hmm. we actually. Um, Made attempts to recruit her early on, and she started getting involved with doing some way forward projects, um, and then went and did Skullgirls. So, and then also uh, Alex Ahad, that you, you've probably seen him in Skullgirls too. He's worked on a lot of the way forward stuff as well. Oh so, wow! Yeah, um, yeah. There's a lot of people who got their start at at way forward, um, or or some of the early years was was working with us on stuff like um, uh, Joachim Sandberg, who does the Nuito Love stuff, and. Sure. Um, uh, Wow, there's a bunch. Paul Robertson, who did the Scott Pilgrim game, and and as you know, the yacht club guys, um, Sean and and Ian and Waz, and uh, wow, Riverman, um, uh, those guys. I don't know if you know Jacob. Just throwing some names out there, but um, and Jules Washam, the Mutant Buds guy. You know, he worked with us on Sigma Star Saga. So yeah, there have oh, been lots right. of yeah, that. yeah, lots of people. I kind of think of Way Forward as like Batman, and you've got all these like Robins out there, or Nightwings. Yeah, that's a people. that's a good. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm so uh, yeah I'm I'm probably more towards the yeah the Batman Beyond where he's like like uh, I don't know feeling a, feeling a little old and tired right at the moment. 
but not, sure, not, but that, old, not that old. But, but yeah, no, it's cool, and we and it's and it really is because we have um, be, well, the combination of things are always in flux, and we we transition a lot, and then and the talent needs change, um, you know, kind of season by season. But also, we're close to CalArts, and we're and we do have so much about way forward that's about teaching. It's like building mm -hmm. and teaching. So we want people to come in and learn a lot and become experts, and some of them stay. I mean, we've had you know people like. Um, you know, like Adam Tierney, you just mentioned earlier. You know, and and uh, he's been here for a long, long time now. And uh, and and Austin, who's who's you know getting getting there too. I mean, I think he's been here for more than five years, and um, it's great. We love we love that. And you know, it's really sad when people go, and but we don't. You know, we're excited for them when they go and they do their own thing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're sad to see them go, but it's always uh, it's always great when they can get their get their start and kind of learn learn stuff here, and, and we learn a lot from them too. So. But yeah, Skullgirls. If we could get, if if Mariel wanted to put uh, Shantae and Skullgirls, that would be awesome. Um, so total, yeah, we're totally open to it. Very excited. I will try to contain my excitement and not get involved <laughs> too much. That would be, that would be awesome. Cool. Yeah. It would be. Uh, Bowser Press asks, "What do you think about rare games and how they become rarefied? How that works for the Philistines who haven't played them <laughs> uh, and how they get left out? Because Shantae was, uh, it didn't get the appreciation I thought it deserved." When it first it's released on Game Boy Color, and then so you're talking rare. Are you talking rare, like the development studio rare, or are you talking like I think you mean like rare cart games, not like, uh, like rare cartridges? Oh, okay, not like getting getting Diddy Konged or, or yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Not sure. Can you yeah, yeah give, can, give me that a, answer it either way? I guess uh, I'm not sure if we so, get more clarification from him on that. You, meaning I'm not sure. I got that one. Give, give me that. Give me that again. I'll try one more time. Uh, what do you think about rare games and how they become these rarefied works? I believe oh. he means that they must be hard to find uh, because Shantae was worth so much money, but it wasn't right. played okay. by as many people as it could have been if it was right. worth less money on the used market. Well, okay, if, if he, he might also be like thinking along the lines of um, they get overinflated. Like mm -hmm. like they're like they're too self important, um, and that's very possible. I mean, this game it is it is a uh, it is a very hard to find game. The manufacturing numbers were really low. Um, you could uh, stores. I, I was told by a Capcom guy the stores only got them if they re if they ordered Resident Evil Gaiden, they got Shantae's in the box. Like that's how they tricked them into getting them into stores. Um, oh, wow. So they, yeah. So they'd open it up, and instead of I forgot how many are in a box, but you get X amount in a box, and then um, and then a couple of um, of Shantae's in there, um, yeah. I'd say just be, you know, it it, it is still, it, you know, it's it's still humble beginnings. I mean, we put tons and tons of love into it. It's there are parts of it that are very polished because the game was in development for two years, and mm -hmm. at the, the beginning portions of the game are very polished. There are later portions in the game that just some weird stuff will happen. Like I've seen people do let's plays, and they're like, man, it stinks getting caught in this cannon and bouncing on the walls over and over and over. Sorry, Brick Road. I, you're one of those dudes. Um, and it's it's. I'm like, wow. Why didn't we just have five or six different ways of solving that so people wouldn't get stuck? It's just because we were two guys. You know that we were um, we were doing this after hours and and oftentimes late at night. We we're working on Shantae while we made Sabrina's and Wendy's and the WC, WCW Mayhem and Betrayal and all these other games. Um, so sometimes it's you know, and we're testing the game ourselves. This was before we had a testing group. You know, we're playing them and testing them. So yeah, it's uh, those games are great. They're absolutely loaded with inspiration, um, mm. but they might be rough around the edges. So yeah, they, um, they're they great. I would highly recommend you play them, but also I see them for what they are. At, they're, yes, they're, they're huge collectibles. Are they the best game you're ever going to play? I, uh, there's, there's more polished games out there, but if you're looking for the most polished games, you're probably going to find a first-party Nintendo. If you're looking for something that's just like, like a, an amazing footnote in, or, or the... Um, you know, kind of like, hey, where did this come from? How did this begin? That's what these games are about. So I think it's good that they're celebrated, um, but I think that they should also be recognized as, you know, some in some cases, first-time efforts, and you know, appreciate them for the love we put into them. But they they don't need to be put on a pedestal and, and worshipped for anything more than what they are. They're just <laughs> they're just cool games that we were trying to make back then. So I don't know. For me, it was worth five dollars to get it on the virtual console just to see Shantae's animation as she walks. From the mm. foreground into the background in the town. Yeah, that yes. was worth my five bucks. I love that I animation. They pulled that off. Yeah, it was awesome. That animation was done. I, I mentioned that two guys worked on it. Um, me and Jimmy worked on it most of the time. Jimmy's the guy who did uh, Mario Brothers for the what was it, the Commodore sixty four. 
Like he's an oh, amazing, wow. amazing programmer. Um, he's been around forever. But there was a period of time where we had some extra people helping out. Um, my wife Erin did some animation. She did that big water boss monster that you see at the beginning. And then Luke Brookshire, who went on to make the, um, he does the SpongeBob show. Um, he's the uh, he he did that animation you're talking about where she runs in the door. And it's just like one of the coolest animations. That's that's Luke. So when you see Luke Brookshire, like when you're watching SpongeBob, you know, always watch who did the show. It's either going to be uh, this guy Zeus, or it's going to be Luke, or it's going to be uh, there's a couple of other guys. But um, yeah, same guy, same Luke. So check. So your yeah. wife worked on Futurama. Mm -hmm. You've worked on the Muppets, uh, Muppet franchise. Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. got SpongeBob anime. What? Yeah. Who are you? Yeah. I I want to know who you didn't uh, have yeah, some Luke. connection to. Uh, well, I. You ever do a Monty I mean, well, Python game? That might be the only thing I haven't done yet. No, no, but all, all of our, I mean, that's one of the, yeah, all our CalArts buddies, you know, they were all doing, um, they went off to do different things, and, and me and Rob going into, oh, Rob, by the way, Rob Buchanan, I have to say this, because Rob's, he's like still, I haven't talked to, Rob, I'm sorry, I haven't talked to you in a while. Um, it, it's, um, but he he went to, when he's, he, after years and years, I mean, I think almost 20 years at Way Forward as, as employee number one, um, he saw that uh, LeVar Burton was going to re reboot Reading Rainbow, and he went to start that up with him. So, Le so he's he yeah I know I'm, I'm like <laughs> so was, you're, you're one like, degree on. of separation from LeVar Burton now. Yes, yeah. So he's doing he's doing <laughs> Reading Rainbow with, with LeVar that's Burton, incredible. and it is it's amazing. Yeah, and I, I it's just so cool. So, um, but yeah, back then everybody was doing different stuff. I mean, we had. Um, you know, our teachers were making Animaniacs at, at night. They were pitching that show, if I remember right. And uh, what were some of the other ones? Um, yeah, there's a lot. I think once you get into CalArts territory, there's just a lot of crossover with people doing different stuff. So, like, our roommate who was starting up the um, the, uh, the the company with us, and then he went on and he was animating those Coca-Cola bears where you see the polar bears drinking Coke. You know, that was him. And... Uh, well, then, then he went and did the Shrek movies and and stuff like that. So you got all these people. They're like, Matt, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I might be doing this Mary Kate Nashley CD uh, uh, CD ROM game. And they're like, why don't you do the, you know, like like these these dudes are starting up Pixar. I'm like, oh, that sounds boring. You do it's like cool to. <laughs> I'm like feeling like such a, such a uh, such a chump. But anyway, I love I love working here and I love the adventure that it's been and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So. Um, yeah, but there you get you get so many talented people coming in here. Like out of CalArts, we're a local studio. They come in, they get their start, try some stuff out. They learn about the industry, and then sometimes they move on and they do just like amazing things. And I'm proud of them. I love to just sit back and watch watch what they're doing, and it's it's cool because I get to be a part of it, you know, through them. So yeah, absolutely <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I think we can get through these questions. I think okay. we can do it because we're not I'll that keep, over I'll time. Them, I'll keep them short. Oh yeah, you're doing great. Albatross Matt asks, is there any chance of uh, some of the Shantae half-genie hero stretch goals uh, becoming DLC if they don't get funded in oh, yeah. Kickstarter? That's a, that's a great, oh, okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, yeah, it's kind of tied into the question you had earlier about the 400K. Um, you guys probably know, or anyone who's poked around those boards you know, on Kickstarter and stuff, that's not a, lot of, that's not a big ask for a multi-console, that's maybe more in line with what we would um, expect for a handheld download game. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the answer for that is, yes, we, um, we'd love to do... We'd love to, we, our goal is to get the project um, ultimately developed and out on the market. The, um, the, the ask of 400K is to allow us to, to be able to do it because we could probably fund a certain amount on our own. As you guys have seen, we do fund original games. Um, but not something this this big. So it, to, to at the rate that it takes to do a bunch of contract work, save some money, put some towards the game, go back and do the contract work, it, to get the multi-console game j just to the point where we could ship it, we'd probably be working on that for about three to four years, and that's not an exaggeration. I think that's based on uh, what history has shown. Um, mm. And then if it's doing well, of course we love and support our games. You guys see us doing stuff where maybe it doesn't even make any sense because we're not necessarily making money, but we'll do the Switch Force 1 levels on 3DS just because it seemed fun, and we would probably do that with this game too. So yeah, having them be... Uh, for people who don't know, there was an update to Mighty Switch Force 
that added new levels, and it was just for free. It's just like here's more. Yeah, game. It, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a trick. It was we just thought, hey, you know, it would make people probably like the game more. It might increase the sales a little bit if they see that we love it. And um, and again, it's not a stunt because we actually do love it. We're we're not doing it to to trick you into thinking we love it. We really do. So mm-hmm. um, could those things be DLC later? Yeah, my my hope with uh, I, here's what I'm here's what I'm about. Um, I'll be directing that game, and I want to make the game as good as it can be. And and when it's done for the people who bought it and are enjoying it, I want to keep putting more stuff into it. So it's going to come down to just can we afford to do it? And if we can afford to do it because it got funded, then we can do it for sure because it's funded. If I just have the intent to do it and we have to wait for money to roll around because we have a good year, I mean, that's how it's going to go. Um, So it's, you know, we probably wouldn't do everything on those stretch goals um, if it came down to we were only able to get you know, uh, I don't even know, X amount of game done, um, that might suggest it's going to be hard for us to get all of those stretch goals met on our own dime, but um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, if, it, if it gets funded, it's a guarantee, and that's right. the whole point of trying to fund it, is if, if you guys make it happen, then it's going to happen. If it's, if it's on me to do it, it's going to be a little bit uh, left, well, a lot of bit left to chance, and sure. how things just happen to go. That so, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see... Ignacio Stern asks, mm-hmm. can you tell us about the software and tools being used at WayForward now compared to back in the day? And I'm sure that's changed mm. a lot over the years. Yeah, it's changed tremendously. That's like, that is a good question for our engine team. Um, and maybe we should write an update on that because I would slaughter the the names of everything if I tried to do it. They're like, no, 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 you, you described that wrong. Um, so I'd, I'd almost rather rather not. But as far as the art tools go, we're still doing some more pixel stuff in um, promotion. Um, our 2D animation is we we didn't really like the way things tend to go in Flash because it kind of looks like it's made out of moving pieces, and that's not mm-hmm. what traditional full frame animation is about. So we're doing everything in Toon Boom now. That's how we do oh, the cool. um, stuff that looks like TV. Um, mm-hmm. The engine is proprietary, internal engine um, that the the guys here made. Uh, we have uh, boy, there's you know, we do have off-the-shelf physics and things like that that we use. Um, level design is being built in 3D Studio Max. And what else can I say? Um, that might cover most of it. I'm not sure what Jake uses for, for music. It'd be nice to give a list. Maybe we should just kind of list out, hey, here's some of the tech that we use. You know, we use a lot of, um, we use a lot of uh, Photoshop stuff. I think the effects are done... If I remember right, I think the effects team works in something that was made for them. I think that was made internally. Uh, I'd have to double-check. Huh. Cool. But yeah, maybe we should cover that in an update because that sounds really interesting, and I'd I'd like to know more about what we're doing right at this moment. Um, but we we transition all the time. We're always discovering something new to use or writing something new. So yeah, awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asif Akrat asks, mm-hmm. and this is something I meant to get to as well. Um, he asks a kind of a long question. I'm going to try to do the whole thing. Okay. And you set it the record straight with a deal with Shantae's color in the new Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. Did she drink too much coffee, Whitener? <laughs> Uh, all in seriousness, some of the comments on the Kickstarter page border on gross discussions of certain skin tones being, quotes, more yeah. attractive, unquotes. What role does right. race play in the game, if any? I never thought... I thought of Shantae as a purple-haired person who spends time in the sun, and I never really thought of she was... Uh, but it, it it's interesting how much of a, yeah. a touch point it's become for people that they really want her to maintain sort of a, a brownness... Right. Um, so yeah, what yeah, happened there? I was surprised that um, that this became the the uh, such a you know thing that people were vocal about. But at the same time, um, I didn't really uh, I've never given a lot of thought to this game being about like um, uh, like the, like a like a particular ethnicity. Like you said, it's like it's you know Shantae. If you look at the pictures of her over the years, they're just whatever um, you know her, her skin tone and stuff. It's whatever. The artist just drew at the time. Um, mm-hmm. There's, there's never, it's, it's never really been um, really about that. So, yeah. The, well, so, as far, as, far as the, though, is there a new yeah. artist on Half Genie Hero? Is that why yeah. the character uh, design, uh, the proportions are different? That's sort of yeah. Thing? There, yeah, there is the now the actual the the um, the sprite. I think most of what was going on here is there were probably two. It was the key art that you see when you click on the video, um, and then there was the uh, what the sprite design looks like. Now the sprite design is. Um, uh, oh, by the way, I'm glad it, it seems that 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 issue has been been put to rest by just the recent images that have gone up, um, which have like a more of a um, y- you know true to the the uh, DS game color scheme. Mm-hmm. Seems like people sure. like that, and 
Yeah, I mean, like like I said earlier in the first you know initial comments, it is all just work in progress. And no, it's not about a, you know, there was not a, an agenda, you know, to 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 do something there. And I apologize for anybody who who got that impression. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, where was I going with that? Is the um, uh, the character you see is the is the sprite. So the way that she will look in in terms of let's say you get you know we like to do this a lot. We'll have like a, a portrait slide in, and the character looks a certain way there. And then there's the sprite. So right now we're talking about the sprite. Like this character design is what she'll look like on the screen, being two blocks tall in order to be able to do her standard whip and her higher whip. Um, that's what that is. And the reason the for the um, the skin tones, it's not just the skin tones, it's how red her pants are, how purple her hair is, it's everything, is um, this is when um, when designing that. I, so uh, the the new character, that's, that's, that's me. The older characters, those are me too. So I designed those characters like as she goes over the years. And then I hand it off to other artists and I get their input and we work on it and we refine it because um, I, I don't have the time as much to, to refine every drawing anymore. And, and I have a very supportive team and they're excellent. Um, but uh, yeah, that one. The way I arrived at that is, I took the sprite of the um, the, the DS Shantae and I put it on our HD background, um, and then I um, blew it up to enormous, basically traced over it, kind of similar to the way we did this the Scrooge McDuck stuff, and then I shrunk it way back down, and I go, okay, now in this complex, you know, forest scene, um, and it didn't look like the forest that we have now. It was a little bit different. Um, I need this, like the character is getting lost in the scene, so how do I, I like, I need to like go through the same regular drills of making it pop out. So basically what I do there is I contrast, I drag the contrast up. I, I talk about this in a, a comment um, in the boards a little bit. Um, I, I crank the contrast up, I change the head size, I, um, I it make her eyes, whatever it is, and I'm working with it at a at it this big on screen. And once I can see it at that size, I'm like, all right, this this gives you a good idea of what it's going to look like from someone looking at a TV screen, sitting a comfortable couch distance away, you know, playing like this in a world that is like zoomed out enough to where you're seeing, you know, maybe um, 12 to at most, maybe say 20, you know, Mario blocks tall worth of screen real estate. That's how we get to that. It, so, um, so you can imagine uh, after that, um, it, we then we blow it up to a, a full screen image and then clean up over it and you'll notice there's other things too like not not just that her her skin tone is exceedingly bright but her neck if you took that collar off her neck is like crazy crazy long um, her eyes are really nuts like they're extremely tall her pelvis is really long and the bottom of her pants is like so low that it couldn't even exist on a human being but when you shrink it down and you look at it this big you're like, okay, I can see where that is, um, and I, I, that's something that we, we just learned from years of making uh, licensed characters and putting them on screen, like with, um, you know, it's kind of like Mickey's, Mickey, Mickey Mouse's white gloves. It's so that when he walks along, you won't lose track of them as they pass in front of his, of his body, um, or things like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I wasn't, I'll be honest, I wasn't prepared for, for that response, and I was like, oh my gosh, I, yeah, maybe, huh, I guess. And so as I'm looking at the, um, as I'm looking at the pictures, I'm like, oh yeah, she is really different. We lined them all up, and I'm like, hmm, like this, this is for sure the lightest skin tone she's had since the original, original, original drawings, and I can see where that would set some people off. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, like I said earlier, it was never about that. I do think everyone who who brings it up, they do have a good point, and that's why we responded to it quickly and 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 said, yeah, okay, so this is you know, th this is the way that she she looks if you just do the regular drag and drop. When we get into actual development, there are going to be some some kinds of. Um, you know, compromises that'll have to be made in terms of going, all right, if we're doing an additive shadow layer or skin tone, the base color might be different because once you write lighting filters on top, um, it can change the way it is. So let me, let me explain it a different way. The goal is to make it look the way you see it on the, uh, on the update we did. I think it was like update number three where she's much more uh, tan colored. Um, mm. That's the goal. The, um, the base character probably just shouldn't have been used in key art because it's mm. like so so uh, uh, pale right. looking, so sure. yeah, I think I think that's it. Did it did make it? You know, you mess with people's expectations, and and um, it can it can cause some trouble. Well, how so. awesome is it that people care? I mean, you've created yeah. this character. Yeah, is, yeah. He's had so many ups and downs. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for years people thought Shantae was uh, never going to come back. Uh, the right. game lingered in in uh, 
uh, limbo for so long. Yeah. Uh, now people are are angry that she's not as brown yeah. as they're used to. So I mean, that's a, that's a good yeah, it's a good sign because it tells you that people have taken ownership of it, you know. And at that point, mm-hmm. it's like, wow. So this is this is really getting to be like um you know kind of a classic brand that people care about and they feel invested in and now I think our job as as developers and as the keepers of that brand is we got to keep our ears open and listen and um, and that's what we intend to do so um, yeah is and, and did I did I cover that oh I'm fantastic thinking if there's yeah. I'm thinking if there's any other other uh, bits to that that no. um, are important interesting to think that just how you design the color scheme of a character is different on a handheld than it would be on uh, on a TV. That's uh, so interesting oh, yeah. to think about, oh, yeah. and how some characters transition uh, well between uh, handheld and TV, mm-hmm. and how others don't. But anyway, yeah. I got to get to more questions. So one last question: mm-hmm. Our Xanadu asks, uh, "Have you any thought on writing a book of your experiences running uh, and working uh, at WayForward? <laughs> that would be so good. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> would you'd that- have to stop making games for." to write a book. Yeah, I don't know. It, um, I had not... Uh, that would be that would be interesting. I don't know. Is that something people would want to know about? Yeah. I, I think I mean, more I like, and more I, people I, are I like seeing r- video... Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, no. I, just, I, like, I like writing. I, I think it's really cool. I was in, inspired by... Where is it? Somewhere somewhere here I've got uh, Scott Rogers' book, you know, the, the Level Up book. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, right, right, right. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, he, yeah, I, I, I love that uh, I love that he went and just started writing, uh, hey, hey, everybody, here's what can go through your head when you start thinking about games. And I thought I'd considered doing something like that, um, but I never really thought much about doing it as um, just stories from the, the perspective of, of, of going through it all. But that's really interesting if... Um, yeah, there are some weird stories. I mean, my goodness, I've only touched upon like the teeniest little fraction of of um, stuff we've seen over the years. So, yeah, I Maybe would be as a, a reward that. as the Half Genie Hero Kickstarter continues. And you've got another <laughs> twenty five days on it. Is that right? Yeah, it yeah, it's doing great. It looks like um, it looks like it's about half funded, and we're on day four or five. I guess we're on day five, right? Yeah, yeah, day I five. think so. Um, so yeah, I think it. I mean, it's looking good for getting funded. I'm hoping that we'll be able to get uh, enough for the. Um, you know, to make some stretch goals. I, I I don't know about you, but I'm extremely enthusiastic about the Patricia Wagon costume. Like, I yeah. think it would be it would be criminal to not um, excuse the unexp- the the pun <laughs> <laughs> the, to not to not hit that one. We gotta we gotta do that. Um, the other ones we're gonna reveal some more of these as we go. Uh, be just and we were just doing that for for fun. I hope that's that's okay. This is our first Kickstarter, so we're kind of feeling it out. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I want to see that happen, and I'd like to see the game be able to have a little more, um, a little more flexibility in development. The like being funded higher allows us to do things like, um, for example, I like to at times throw animation away or tear down levels completely and start them over. I want to, like the the original Shantae game. We did three three of that first labyrinth, I, I think, and you never saw them. You saw the third one because the first ones. I'm like, you know, we could do better. Let's start. Let's start over. It's like what? But we're we're a year in. It's like, let's start over anyway. Let's tear it down. And, you know, I hear great stories about Half-Life and how they trashed the whole game and started over. And you usually you can't do that. I mean, work for higher stuff, it's really hard to do that when you're working for contract. But when you have the flexibility to go, that boss was cool, but you can tell that it's like a, a B or a B or a B plus, and it could be an A or an A plus. Like, we could do better. Let's do it. Let's Let's go ahead and Let's do it. Let's tear it down and build it again, or or push that to another point in the game where it feels better, and let's make a new you know a new thing. And I'd like to be be able to have the flexibility to do that because the Shantae games have all benefited from that. Um, and so I think a lot of times people go, well, Shantae must be better than than you know maybe they care about it more. Um, that's not necessarily the case. It's that we had more flexibility to to develop the game, and development is the word, right? Because it's not necessarily we have all the answers and we make the game in a straight line. It's not that we construct a game. Like, we want to be able to develop a game, and to fully develop it means you find what's working and you move stuff out that isn't and you bolster stuff that is. So, um, yeah, it's just more time and flexibility for development. So we want, yeah, we're hoping we fund yeah. at a higher level. Yeah. Making a game, I imagine, is just like... You have a relationship with the game. It's almost like a living thing, and as you get yeah. to know what you've created, you have to alter what you create to fit with uh, the overall dynamic. And oh man, I can only imagine what that's like. I've yeah. talked to so many people who make it, and I'm still just uh, blown away that you're able to yeah. do it. And we didn't talk about Pirates Curse at all. Uh, that's coming oh. soon. That looks great. Pirates so Curse. So many. Uh, 
Yeah. So many new things, so many, uh, so much new art, so much of a new feel. It really, yeah. from what I played at PAX, it really felt like uh, the refinement, the the greatest refinement of the Shantae cool. concept. Thank you. Art. Hey, I didn't answer your question, um, and I, I should at least touch on it. Yes, there is a different artist, and we're going to reveal that artist in our um, one of our updates coming up. So, oh, cool. sorry about that. Yeah, the, if it looks a little different, yes, um, that that's the reason why. And I am working with that artist, and uh, but um, not to not to confuse the the you know back on that that skin tone issue. I that's I gave the color scheme to that artist. That's that's. You know, I just want to make sure it's clear. It's like what that artist must be must be bad. It's it's not the case. So, um, you know, like like I said, like I said, you gotta you, you know when with que questions of of brand and what is with this character, you know, you gotta look look back th this way. It's so, anyhow, um, sure, sure. yeah. So yeah, pirates curse. Let me know yeah. if you want to talk about that another time. I'd love to. You know, uh, people should just that. get it yeah. immediately. Yeah, that's all they need to know. Cool, just get it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I think we're now we're really almost out of time. Okay. Two hours. Oops. They should follow you on Twitter. You're Mr. Boson. Yes. On Twitter. Yes. That's because my middle initial is Robert, or is uh, R for Robert. Oh. Yeah. So it was just a weird, that. just a weird yeah. coincidence. I'm like, well, let's go with it. That's funny. It's funny. <laughs> and uh, uh, they they should check out the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, frequent updates are coming mm -hmm. up. I'd love to see updates that are just you telling stories about things that happen. <laughs> okay. More people get to know you guys as developers, as hopefully the show uh, and whole all of Way Forgest has done. Uh, <laughs> hopefully guess. people are getting to see that you guys are so passionate about when you yeah. have taken uh, the the road that would lead to most potential financial success, but uh, thrown away all these creative projects and just chased the market. But instead, yeah. you've yeah. been compatible with the market and constantly changed your approach in order to make sure that you can stay viable, but at the same time have been willing to take these huge risks when you have the, the money and the time and energy to do so. And I really hope that people get behind you for that because it's a pretty rare thing for uh, a developer to reach your level of size but still maintain that kind of creative uh, core to you that you're you're really in it for the love of games. The way yeah, that's, 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 that's right. Yep. I figured it out after talking to, geez, I think six way forward guys over the yeah. past 12 months. I think I finally have you guys figured out. <laughs> as, uh, I'm glad somebody does. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> I hope everyone else does yeah. too. Uh, as for me, I am Tron Knots on Twitter, and the show is now on the Destructoid YouTube channel. You can catch reruns of it. Geez, 70 something. We've done quite a few. Uh, you can watch those reruns on either Detroit TV YouTube channel or also uh, now on the Destructoid channel on YouTube, and you can listen to it again on iTunes later on. They're all up there. Except, I'm pretty sure that the Hotline Miami one got up there. That was an interesting one. I don't know if you've ever met those guys. Hotline Miami. Oh. It'd be interesting to see a Way Forward Hotline <laughs> Miami crossover, let me tell you. And how much would I love it if Way Forward made the new Small Wonder game? Vicky, the, the magical robot girl. She's so great. <laughs> be perfect. Think about it. There's a, new, right that there's a new one? No. There should yeah. be. Oh, okay. Made by you, please. <laughs> In the spare time. <laughs> okay. Just, just shout out a Small Wonder <laughs> game for me. Thank you. I will, and I guess that's it for it, Matt. Oh, I almost started okay. singing the song. Like, don't sing the song. <laughs> you, yeah. you can't. No, no, you should. No. What a perfect way to go out. I'm going to start. She's a small wonder, lovely I, and bright with dark curls. She's a small wonder, a girl like other girls. Matt was on. Thank you.